Uh, can you still hear me? Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, you know what I mean. Um, it's, it's just a very frustrating, very frustrating thing. Rather than focusing on where the problem really is and then try to fix it there, where it's really going to be done instead of the kind of window dressing that these, these kind of cliches of, you know, if we can even save one life uh, here and there, of course, of course that's worth saving, but um, at what price? The, our, our, it's, it's just a frustrating thing. It's like in a classroom if there's one person that misbehaves all the time, and, and the class is slowly punished. You, pu you punish the entire class every time this one or two people misbehave. It's All right, sir, got to let you go. Why not show, uh, when you see that long shot of the room we're in here and you see right behind me, that is a live picture. Many people always are surprised that uh, that Capitol is not a painting back there and not a photograph. We're done for today on our open phones. This is uh, April 7th, year 2000. Coming up in just a moment, the hearing is all about the Office of Management and Budget, and here is Steve Horn. Uh, being present, the uh, Subcommittee on Government Management Information and Technology will come to order. The Office of Management and Budget is one of the most important agencies in the executive branch of the government. The OMB coordinates the legislative opinions of the administration and reviews and recommends budget requests to the president, which he then decides and submits an annual budget to Congress. The budget is a key document of state that affects the funding level of nearly every federal program that Congress provides. Provides. OMB directors and some of the 500 member staff also coordinate the opinions of relevant departments and agencies. OMB reminds the president that legislation is not in accord with the program of the president, whether it should be signed or vetoed. In addition, the OMB has an enormous impact on U.S. businesses because its role in determining federal regulations that affect everything from how buildings are designed to the amount of pollutants that industries may release into the environment. The OMB is clearly at the pinnacle of the executive branch of the federal government. During the Harding administration, the Budget and Accounting Act of 1921 created OBM's, uh, the Office of Management and Budget's predecessor, otherwise known as the Bureau of the Budget. Uh, for housekeeping purposes, the Bureau of the Budget was lodged in the Department of the Treasury, but it reported to the President. A core group of professional staff members were attracted, and over time, uh, for the first time, the president was able to make a true integrated executive budget, which recommended the choices of the uh, nation's chief executive. It used to be that uh, every cabinet officer just sent their estimates into uh, the Treasury Secretary. He put a nice, pretty binder on it, sent it up to Congress. They tore it all apart, and the 13 subcommittees of appropriations probably go back to about uh, 1865 when they created the uh, appropriations committee uh, out of ways and means. So uh, for the first time in the 1920s, although a couple of presidents had tried it, Washington, uh, Harding was able to see it done. And we had an integrated budget where the chief executive could truly tell the people that I have control over the executive branch. And over the years, the Bureau had a very fine professional staff that built up. It didn't matter whether they were serving Republicans, Democrats, or whoever. They were professionals. Under the Nixon administration, the word management was added to the agency's title with the hope that the power of the budgeting process would force federal agencies to give greater attention to management issues. And I happen to have been a very strong fan of that reorganization. Turns out I was dead wrong. That's not been the case. We have not had the management aspects that we should have. If the federal government had a proper management structure, all government agencies would have begun preparing for the year 2000 computer problem a decade ago. But in fact, only the Social Security Administration had a management team with such foresight. Last week, the subcommittee learned that again this year, the executive branch failed to produce government-wide financial statements that auditors could say were reliable. It is important to note that this lack of leadership is not limited to the current administration. Throughout OBM's history, beginning with the Nixon administration, management and budget issues have competed for attention. And we all know the big problem was the budget and how to get it under control, how to get a balanced budget. When you have that, the director is fully occupied with his or her time. 
uh, we have distinguished witnesses today who can discuss the inner workings of the Office of Management and Budget, and we hope to learn whether the M in OMB stands for Management or Mirage. It's now my pleasure to yield time to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Turner, the ranking member of the subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. OMB's uh, predominant mission is, as I understand it, to assist the President in overseeing the preparation of the federal budget and to supervise uh, its administration uh, in the executive branch agencies. In carrying out this mission, OMB is forced uh, to wear many hats. Uh, their duties include the development and management of budget, the policy of legislative, regulatory information, procurement, and management issues. And in addition to these considerable responsibilities, the Congress is continually adding new ones. We can all agree that OMB has a very important and a very difficult job. Our purpose today is to assess how OMB is carrying out its mission and to determine whether Congress is providing adequate funding and support uh, to OMB. We want to make sure federal managers have all the tools and all the incentives necessary to perform their job well. I want to welcome uh, Director Jack Lew this morning uh, and commend him and all of the OMB employees for the excellent work and dedication and professionalism that they've exhibit, exhibited. Um, Jack, you've shown an even hand in running OMB. It's been reflected in the credibility that you enjoy on both sides of the aisle here in the Congress. And I believe that uh, it's the OMB's steadfast work that has helped us come to the point where we can enjoy surpluses in the federal budget for the first time in 30 years. Uh, I want to thank the chairman for focusing on the issue this morning. It's a very important one. And I look forward to hearing from all of our witnesses. I thank the gentleman. And uh, we will now swear in the witness, if you will raise your right hand. And if there's any others that are going to advise you and get on the record, let them stand, too, so we don't have to have numerous baptisms. Uh, do you affirm that the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? The clerk will note that the witness has affirmed the oath, and we welcome you here, and uh, please proceed in any manner you'd like. You have a wonderful 30-page uh, statement. Don't read it, but if you can uh, get the high points, which is what our rule is here, because then we can have a dialogue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would be delighted to summarize my uh, my opening statement and would ask that the full statement be included in the record. Well, automatically, every time we introduce the witness, the resume, and the full statement is in the record. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Congressman Turner. Um, it really is a pleasure to be here this morning to be able to take some time to talk about the, uh, the many important functions that the Office of Management and Budget serves. I'd like to begin by introducing Sally Katzen, who's w with me here today, uh, who uh, serves as a counselor uh, to me as director and as you know, she's been nominated uh, to be the Deputy Director for Management uh, and works on many of the issues that we'll be discussing today. Um, I, I'd like to begin, before going into my, uh, my, my formal uh, remarks, uh, by saying a word about the OMB staff um, and to just associate with the comments that uh, both uh, you, Mr. Chairman, and, and you, Congressman Turner, made. Uh, I think one of the, the secrets of Washington is, is the uh, excellence of the OMB staff, the dedication of them, and the fact that it is not a political staff, that in an in a organization with 518 uh, full-time positions, uh, that the vast majority, uh, you know, nearly 500, are career uh, public servants who serve administration after administration. And they're really the backbone of our efforts, both in terms of what we do on the budget and what we do in, in management, to give the president the kind of advice that he needs to give the guidance to agencies and to work with the Congress in the way that we try to uh, as effectively as we can. Um, what, I, what I'd like to do uh, in my opening uh, statement is just talk briefly about the different functions of the Office of Management and Budget, because I, I, I suspect that there's going to be some interest this morning in talking about the breadth of functions, not just the, the, the budget uh, functions that, uh, that are fairly well known. 
Um, as, as you noted in your opening remarks, it, it ranges from procurement policy and regulatory policy to funding levels for individual programs. It is really the full scope of the work that the federal government does. Uh, we're organized uh, in, uh, in a way that's designed to integrate the different functions that OMB has. We have five resource management offices which are, are, have agency and program responsibility. They pay a key role in developing the budget and executing the budget, and also in working with the agencies on an ongoing basis on implementing their programs. We have the Budget Review Division, which analyzes the aggregate trends. One of the things that's really changed in terms of budgeting over the last 25 years is the ability, partially because of, of uh, information technology, to do much more by way of aggregate analysis and understanding how the pieces add up and what the trends uh, would be uh, in a way that you couldn't uh, when you were doing it on manual uh, kinds of ledgers. Uh, the Legislative Reference Division, as you noted, Mr. Chairman, gives us the ability to coordinate across the government uh, uniform positions so that agencies conform to the policy that the President has made and, and that agencies with competing interests uh, have a, a way of working through their differences so there is a single executive branch position. We also have three statutory offices, uh, which are lesser known outside of Washington, but perform key functions around the government and in terms of coordinating the efforts of all of OMB's uh, staff. We have the Office of Federal Financial Management, which develops and provides direction on the implementation of financial management policies. Uh, we have the Office of Federal Procurement Policy, which leads in our efforts to improve uh, and make more efficient our procurement laws and, and the implementation of those laws. And we have the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, which participates in the rulemaking process, the information technology uh, pr process, and, uh, and the paperwork and monitoring uh, paperwork burdens. Um, we have tried to organize uh, over the last seven years to have these different offices integrated, uh, to have a kind of desk officer system where within each of the statutory offices there are resources available to each of the, the resource management offices so that we can team together people who are expert in the substance and the programs of an agency and other offices that have analytic technical skills that need to be available broadly across the organization. Um, I would say that we've made tremendous progress in that and it is an ongoing effort that, uh, that we will continue and I hope that my successor will also continue with. Um, the, uh, the, the traditional responsibilities that we have are obviously the development of the budget, the, the presentation of the budget, and the defense of, of the budget, and uh, there's no doubt that that takes a considerable amount of our time. Uh, the budget process being as it is, is not a one or two month process, it goes across the whole year. Um, we have tried very hard uh, to try and use the islands of time between the internal uh, deadlines to produce a budget and the congressional schedule to focus senior management efforts on the management issues as well as the budget issues over the course of the year. Um, one of the things that has happened in my uh, time at OMB, and, and I probably have a slightly different perspective than many directors have, having been at OMB for five and a half years, I'm right up there with our career st staff in terms of, of length of tenure uh, on average. Um, our workload burden has grown. It's grown for good reasons. Uh, we've worked well with the Congress on laws like Klinger Cohen and GPRA that have given us new and modern tools to try and take the management responsibilities and really put some, some effective uh, tools behind them. Um, I would note that over the course of the increase in those responsibilities, we've decreased our, our, the size of our staff. Uh, we've been a fit and become more efficient, but we also have heavy workload burdens, and it's for that reason that in the budget that we presented this year, we did ask for additional resources. I think this is an appropriate time uh, at, at a point of transition for us to look ahead at the next administration, regardless of party, and to say that this is, these functions are important and we do need more resources to perform all of them. Um, we, uh, we have tried to take the management role very seriously in my time at OMB, and you know, I think that evidence of that is, uh, is a, evident in both the formal mechanisms, the committees that we have, the interagency committees that have done a lot to share best practices between agencies and help develop best practices, uh, and the less formal uh, approaches, uh, the, the efforts to coordinate with heads of agencies and at working levels in agencies on specific problems. 
the, uh, the, there are really two kinds of management challenges. There are the government-wide management challenges, which are very important, ranging from dealing effectively with the Y2K problem, where I think we actually have a success that we can be proud of, uh, to, uh, to trying to make the kind of progress on our audited financial statements that keeps us moving in the right direction, and a host of other areas. Uh, we also have agency-specific problems where we see that agencies either are not doing something that they need to do well, or they could be getting a lot more done if they made changes, and we try to engage with the agencies both at the broad and at the agency-specific level. Uh, I won't uh, contest the notion that there are limits on our time. There certainly are, but we try within those limits to be effective at both the government-wide and the uh, agency-specific level. Um, I'd like to say a word or two about GPRA because uh, I know that this committee has a lot of interest in it. Uh, I have been uh, very uh, uh, impressed at uh, how much the culture of, of, of government and policy thinking has changed over the last few years. My first director's review, uh, when Alice Rivlin was director, uh, the level of ability to focus on results in terms of the analytic process was very different than it is now. Answers to questions about results more often gave you information about inputs than outputs. We're now at a stage where I think we have made enormous progress, though we have a lot more progress to make. We engage in discussions on virtually every major policy decision probing on the question of outputs. We're not at the point where the measures are as refined as they should be. We're not at the point where I would want to have mechanical decisions flow from that analysis. But we have changed the way we think, which is the first stage you have to go through to the long term, incorporating a, the results-oriented uh, analysis into budgetary policy. Um, I'd like to just say one word in, in conclusion about uh, the connection between the budget and the management issues. I think that uh, there is no, I have no doubt in my own mind that uh, the, it is very important to have the, the budget and management functions together because the, the, the budget responsibilities give you the ability to raise management issues in a way that if the management issues stood on their own, I fear you wouldn't be able to. Uh, there's something that focuses the mind when there's funding at stake. Uh, there's no question that OMB's ability to help shape the president's budget request and work with Congress on the ultimate funding levels has a lot to do with our ability to work with agencies on the management questions. So while I think there are very important questions that we need to resolve in terms of how to do even better on the management side, I think there's an important connection between those functions that I suspect we'll talk some more about. Uh, I, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning, and I look forward to answering uh, any questions that you have. Well, thank you very much for that uh, statement. Um, Mr. Turner and I will be alternating on questions. Uh, each of us will take 10 minutes, and then he'll get 10 minutes. So let me start in with the general management questions. What percentage of the Office of Management and Budget staff of 518 is devoted full-time to government-wide management issues? Um, the uh, the exact number of employees is in the uh, in the 80s. I could look up the number probably and tell you that, that are f 89 uh, full time uh, employees are devoted to management issues. But I think that that is. Uh, could you tell me where they're put around? Are you counting uh, OIRA and? Uh other groups like that? I'm counting the statutory offices uh, in particular. Um, I think that the, the, the difficulty of answering a question like that is, uh, has a lot to do with the integration between the budget and the management uh, functions. Um, if you look at a division like our general government uh, division uh, where we have uh, program examiners who are considered on the budget side, they're not full-time management, and you look at the, the responsibilities they have, it includes working with GSA on on real property policy. Uh, it includes uh, working with uh, another division in our, in, our, in our Health and Human Resources Division. It involves working with the Office of Personnel Management on government-wide personnel policy. I think I would answer the question very differently if you asked me what percentage of OMB staff efforts are put into uh, management issues. I don't know that I'd have an exact answer, but it's a much, much higher percentage. And the desk officer system gives us the ability to integrate the full-time management positions in a way that I don't think uh, was possible before OMB 2000, where there was a much, much harder wall between the two uh, functions. And I think we've made progress at bringing the wall down and having virtually all of OMB's 518 employees think about management in the course of everything that they do. 
What is the, say, two major management uh, examples that are a plus for the administration and the Office of Management and Budget over the last year? What would you say your major two management? Well, I, I know that this is going to be contrary to your own opening remarks, but I think you have to start with Y2K. Um, and, uh, you know, the, managing the Y2K problem is probably the single largest management challenge the federal government has had in modern times. And uh, the relationship that that uh, we at OMB had with John Koskin and who coordinated the effort uh, on behalf of the president for the White House was unique. John is a former deputy director for management. He understood all of the levers that OMB had and the talent and ability that OMB had in this area. And it was a full cooperation where we put the full resources of the federal government to work to tackle the task. Whether it should have begun a month or a year earlier is something we could have a long discussion about. I think we've responded well as the need to respond became apparent. But there's no doubt that we succeeded. We accomplished what people thought was an impossible task. You didn't succeed till we got John in there. And of course, this committee started on April of 1996. Nothing much was happening. John was there as deputy director for management. Nothing was happening. And then he retired. And then he was brought out of retirement. And the president made an excellent choice when he brought him out of retirement. But he wasn't doing that job, which he should have been doing, if that's a major management task. And I agree that it is. And uh, here's Social Security out in uh, 1989 doing it. And nobody's pulling in everybody and saying, look, Social Security says this is a problem. How about your affairs? Isn't that a problem for you? Nothing was happening. I, I think the characterization that nothing was happening is a bit uh, uh, unfair. I think there were a lot of things happening, but I won't contest that it wasn't as much of an effort as we ultimately put in. I think if you look at public and private response, uh, we were responding uh, on in a way that was similar to the private sector. When we realized the problem was much larger, we put more resources into it. The decision for John to come back is one that we encouraged. Uh, it, we, we understood there was a need to do this uh, in a way that was different than the way normal management challenges was done. And I don't think it could have been done without the uh, very, very uh, significant uh, devotion of resources at OMB. Let me give you an example. The funds that Congress provided for the government to deal with the, the Y2K problem were provided in a fund that the president could disperse based on advice from the Office of Management and Budget. Uh, I don't think that there's another entity in government that could have worked with every agency of government to effectively allocate limited resources. I can tell you the demands for resources at the initial moments when that money was made available far exceeded uh, what, what we could have used the money for and wouldn't have solved the problem if we hadn't worked the way we can at OMB agency by agency, separating out what are desires for more funds generally from what are desires for funds to deal with Y2K and coordinating the effort in the way that we did. So I, I think it was it was a model of partnership. And you know, I applaud you for the uh, efforts you've made in this area. I don't think this is an area where there really is a lot of conflict between us. Uh, the only thing I'm contesting is that we did nothing before. I think that as the problem grew, our efforts grew. Well, when Dr. Rain took your predecessor, took uh, command down there, I suggested to him that we not waste time on budget years, we reprogram existing money. And he agreed with that and did it. Uh, Mrs. Maloney was then ranking member. She and I were sending uh, quarterly report uh, mm -hmm. surveys to the cabinet. We started with the cabinet. Two never heard of the operation. And that was the Secretary of Transportation, Secretary of Energy. I was sort of amazed. And uh, then uh, Dr. Rain said, well, heck, we'll be glad to do that. And I said, you should be. And you did a fine job on getting the quarterly reports. My problem was with 10 years gone by. And we really, we wrote the president, we said, Mr. President, you need a coordinator of this effort. And uh, as I say, he made a very fine choice, but it took forever to do it. I, re I called it the peril of Pauline uh, on the strap to the tracks and the trains coming. And somehow she escapes for the next Saturday movie. And uh, we were very fortunate. But even when John was picked, uh, he didn't take office till April of 98, so a lot of time had been lost. And while we muddled through, as the British say, 
uh, and we're fortunate in that. I guess I would ask what else was going on in OMB besides Y2K if you say something was going on there? Well, during, during the, the, the period that we were dealing with Y2K, we've also been working in procurement policy and information technology generally. You know, my predecessor, you know, Frank Raines, worked very hard to try and take the Klinger Cohen Act and turn it into a tool that the government would use. And we have, since the act passed, used the, what we now call the Raines rules to try and get the agencies to focus on long-term information technology investment in an orderly way where they're, they're, we won't have a repeat of the problems that we had seen before. Um, it's not an easy thing. Uh, agencies had difficulty with, uh, with major uh, information technology procurement. There were many, many experiences where agencies uh, bought systems that were incomplete, couldn't finish the systems uh, on budget, didn't have the ability to do what they needed when they were done. I think we're doing much better. Just in recent weeks, we've extended the same kind of approach on, uh, that we've been using on procurement to security. We sent out guidance to the agencies just a few weeks ago to try and have a, the same kind of central focus. And I think this is actually a, a very good example of how the budgetary and the management functions really reinforce each other. The time of year when I have the most leverage to look at the Klinger Cohen Act and to, to make it stick is when agencies are asking for money for their computer systems. If I say I'm not going to recommend it to the president if they haven't complied with Klinger Cohen and the Reigns rules, they can't go forward. Uh, it's very difficult to make an appeal for your computer system. And we've gotten the agencies to understand that this is not a passing interest. It's part of the way we budget. It's part of the way we approach management. And I think it's far from a job completed. And it's nothing that anyone will ever complete. Given well, the nature of the technology, it's always changing. Uh, I'm delighted that you're doing that survey. We've asked the Controller General to do a survey of all the executive branch hardware and software because we certainly learned our lesson through Y2K, and I'm glad you're taking advantage of the data that were put together. And we'll be glad to work with you, just as we were on the Y2K. Two speakers of the House said, give them every dime they want on Y2K. So you didn't have any problem up here on money. Well, we it, gave it to it you. It took us quite a while to get the supplemental, as you recall. We were very worried when, the, when, when it was pending, but we did get it in the end, and we did it. You got every dime. In, in the interest yeah. of, of this. We can't do what the other body does, <laughs> and uh, we won't even mention that. But uh, In the spirit of GPRA, though, I hope we would look at the results of Y2K, which was a real success, and the success wasn't an accident. It was a result of hard work here, hard work by OMB, hard work by all the agencies, and I think we should be proud of it. Is it correct that you haven't got similar reporting for computer security issues? What is OMB well, doing there? We, we have, in the guidance we put out, uh, tried to set up what will be a new kind of reporting on computer security issues, uh, and we're using, as, as you just noted, the, the work we did in, in terms of Y2K, identifying the, the, the critical missions and working through in priority order. Um, I think that, that, uh, that you know, the, the question of computer security is a very complicated one, and there are competing goods that we have to balance. Uh, you know, in the guidance, we tried to take appropriate concern for both keeping on a path towards becoming part of electronic uh, commerce, electronic government, protecting private interests. And one of the things that was striking to me in putting that guidance together is that the solution is as much low-tech as it is high-tech. It's changing the culture of a system where people leave their computers on at night, don't log off, they just leave it so that machines are out there. Uh, it's not all a question of technology. Some of it is a question of, of just changing our practices. And uh, I think we have to deal with, with the fact that the, the, the threats to computer security uh, involve people who are at the cutting edge, who are always going to try and stay step ahead of us. And we can't think of this as a problem to solve today or tomorrow. We have to get be involved in a process where we're always vigilant for what the threat is and how to stay a step ahead of th those who would threaten computer security. My time has expired. I'm going to yield 10 minutes to the ranking member, Mr. Turner of Texas. Uh, we might get back to computer security if he does not pursue that. Okay. Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Lou, I want to... Uh, follow up on some of the things that the chairman uh, got into. But I'll, to start off, I want to ask you just to describe for me what the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs does. 
Well, uh, they do a number of things, Congressman Turner. They, uh, uh, regulations that agencies are promulgating are cleared by the Office of Information Regulatory Affairs. Uh, major rules uh, go through a cost-benefit analysis uh, to the extent that agencies uh, have concerns uh, across jurisdictional lines. Uh, OIRA uh, provides a mechanism for coordinating conflicting views. Uh, and that is a one of the major responsibilities. Another major responsibility is working with agencies on their information technology uh, management uh, a third is the Paperwork Reduction Act, uh, where the where OIRA works with the agencies uh, approving uh, new paperwork requirements, and and uh, and actually one of the things we're we're about to do is to undertake uh, an interagency effort to see what we can do to further reduce paperwork re requirements. Um, so there really are quite a wide range of, of responsibilities at OIRA. It's a very heavily uh, worked division. Uh, your, your answer made my point. Uh, I'm, I'm very interested in the issue of uh, trying to develop greater expertise and a more aggressive approach to implementing e-government. Uh, I'm of the view that we are falling behind the private sector. Uh, it's a very rapidly evolving field and uh, government generally walks and the private sector is now running and we've got to figure out how to run as well. And your discussion, I think, with Ms. Torn was relevant on this point, and that is your uh, high regard for the efforts that OMB made in cooperation with uh, Mr. Koskin, who was popularly viewed as the Y2K czar. I think his official title was special assistant to the president. Um, what I would like to see, and I'm currently working uh, to try to get the staff of our committee, Mr. Horn, on the same page, to come up with some kind of proposal that will place um, the John Koskin type model uh, within uh, a context of information technology and the emphasis on e-government. Uh, and I'm, I'm convinced that unless we take this kind of very direct approach uh, and create this kind of emphasis, that the federal government's going to continue to lag behind in the development of e-government. Um, we have some issues that uh, I'm sure you and the OMB have some opinions to share with us on, and I want to be sure we kind of have a chance here to air those out, because I know that when we talk about creating a a uh, information technology czar or an e-government uh, special assistant to the president uh, that we begin to step on toes and have turf battles. But if it be true that the John Koskin model worked to solve the Y2K problem, I think that type of model could also work to bring a, a greater emphasis uh, in the federal government toward implementing uh, e-government. And uh, one of the things that I, I wanted to explore a little bit with you was uh, to uh, get you to at least review the things that are currently being done uh, to implement e-government. Now, you made mention, uh, in answer to one of Mr. Horn's questions, you made mention of the fact that uh, uh, in the area of information technology, that we have taken steps to work with the agencies to improve procurement of hardware and software. Uh, that really was the beginning point, as I noted it, as a former member of the Texas legislature in every state around the country, to try to create some central agency to assist the various agencies of state government and now the federal government through your work to be sure we're buying the right equipment, we're not throwing away money uh, on the wrong, making the wrong purchases. Uh, now, through the efforts of Mr. Horn, we have placed an emphasis on this committee on the issue of computer security, which probably ought to be described uh, uh, not only as computer security, but internet security. Uh, it is a very troublesome problem, both in the public and the private sector. Uh, I am of the view that both procurement issues and security issues fit within the broader context of this issue of e-government, uh, emphasis on information technology, and that if we had one person, a John Koskin type person, who could take information technology issues, uh, computer security, procurement, place it in one uh, office, 
uh, have some cooperative working relationship between uh, that individual who would be directly accountable to the president, who had a good working relationship with OMB, so we don't have a turf battle over this, that we could perhaps get uh, emphasis on information technology that's needed to put the federal government into the 21st century. So I'm, I'm open to your suggestions, but perhaps the beginning point is to have you review what we are doing uh, currently. Uh, thank you, Congressman. I, I, let, let me begin by, uh, by just a general observation and then some specific observations about what we're doing and perhaps some thoughts about, about separate versus uh, OMB role. Um, at the conference the president had the other day on the new economy, uh, one of the, the executives of, uh, of a high-tech company said that we're probably, as a, as a broad economy, not even 10 percent into the, the, you know, what the ultimate potential of e-commerce is. I don't know if that's right or wrong, but if it's the right order of magnitude, I don't know that we're very far behind as a government. There's certainly a lot that can be done in the private sector and the public sector, but we're really accomplishing quite a lot. If you look at the number of people who are going to file their tax returns electronically, the number of people who are going to be able to f fill out their census forms electronically, the number of people who are able to follow various NASA missions online. Uh, there are just many, many examples of the federal government uh, being uh, a real presence uh, in terms of e-commerce. I wouldn't suggest that we're halfway down the road yet, but I think there are very good beginnings. One of the things that, uh, that we worked on before people were talking a lot about e-commerce was electronic benefit transfer, which is connected. It has a lot of potential in terms of e-commerce. I would note that our efforts on that were a coordination between John Koskinen when he was Deputy Director for Management and one of our program associate directors, Ken Affel, who was at our Human Resources Division. And I think that the, the, there was a kind of synergy in the way they worked that overcame many, many hurdles which could have been uh, used as reasons to doom uh, moving into electronic benefit transfer. It took years of work to get through the hurdles and I don't think it could have been done without that kind of coordinated effort. The, uh, the observation that I was making earlier about the, the relationship that we had with John Koskin and uh, when he was working on the Y2K process and his own experience with OMB, I can't be uh, uh, overemphasized. John was unique in his, uh, as a former deputy director for management, his understanding of how OMB could be effectively used as part of the process. I think if somebody had come in uh, with expertise in, in information technology without John's familiarity with the different levers and tools, it would have been much more difficult, if not impossible, to be as effective as he was. I think that's suggestive of the, the, the importance of having the OMB uh, functions in this area remain strong and I think remain uh, real leadership roles. I mean, I, I, I think the Deputy Director for Management at OMB is an official of a very senior level who reports to the President. We have been frustrated over the last two and a half years because we haven't had a confirmed Deputy Director for Management, but that's a separate Separate issue. Uh, I think that one can expect the Deputy Director for Management to have a leadership role in this area, working with the head of OIRA, who is a confirmed official, and coordinating with the agencies. I'm afraid that if you were to split the function off and have a kind of permanent independent uh, chief information officer, you would have to build up uh, resources to support that effort uh, that would mirror the resources we have in the Office of Management and Budget if they were going to be effective. And the right answer, I think, is to figure out how to continue to use the authorities and the, and the leadership responsibilities at the Office of Management and Budget to play a lead role in this area. I would argue that the efforts that we've made over the last four years to improve the procurement processes could not be made outside of the budget process. Uh, I don't believe agencies would do things differently today than they did five years ago if it wasn't a part of the budget process. On the other hand, the person sitting at the table in our director's reviews at answering questions was a person who worked full time in the area of information issues, who was a senior official at OMB. There is a synergy there that, that can work. Uh, 
I would say that we have many goals still to achieve in this area. And uh, I think that, uh, that we look at the future as a future of enormous opportunities, but we do have to balance concerns like the privacy concern I mentioned and, and others. We have to be connected, but we, ha we have to protect uh, people's rights as well. You know, we both, I think, understand that in government, you know, things occur and actions usually taken when somebody says there's a crisis. And of course, the Y2K uh, crisis generated a lot of interest and uh, the right person was chosen for the job and Mr. Koskin and the relationship you at OMB had with him was an excellent one. The concerns that you just raised about placing someone in a high profile position, uh, someone of the type personality of Mr. Koskin who had the credibility of Mr. Koskin to move forward on information technology. Uh, I, I think that the objections that you just raised to putting someone into that kind of role could have been made by you and the OMB when it was initially suggested that the, there was going to be a special assistant to the president for Y2K. And so what I'm looking for is, is an understanding of uh, why the John Koskin OMB relationship worked so that I can best figure out how to structure uh, a relationship between a special assistant to the president on information technology or a, a federal CIO, whatever you want to call them. And I, and I even think we sometimes can get tripped up on what we call sure. a, a special assistant to the president for information technology might be more uh, a more friendly title to OMB than a federal CIO, but whatever the title, the point is that I think the emphasis that was placed on Y2K was part of the reason we were successful. And so I'm looking for a way to highlight the importance of the federal government moving aggressively in the area of information technology. And that is the ultimate goal I have, and I think Na government by nature is going to function more effectively in areas where we can feel, figure out how to structure uh, something to give it the emphasis that we want it to have to make people pay attention both within and out of government so we can get the kind of support we need to move forward. That's what I'm looking for. Congressman, I, I don't think that... Uh if you if you look at the process that we went through in terms of setting up the office that John headed, um, it was not at all random that uh, the president uh, sought John to come back to do this. I mean, John brought the experience from OMB as well as the experience he had in the private sector in terms of crisis management, and he he really brought a unique set of skills and was just a tremendous person to, to work with when he was deputy director, when he was the Y two K czar. Um, I think that it's difficult to, to generalize from that a, a uh, kind of formal approach that says, therefore, there needs to be an independent person, uh, whether it w regardless of the title. I agree with you. Titles can often make the discussions uh, uh, more difficult to, to think through. I don't believe that, that uh, if you're talking about long-term uh, government uh, procurement of, of information technology, management of information systems, security of systems. I don't believe it can be separated from the broader questions of agency management and agency budgeting. I think it has to be integrated. I don't disagree with you that it's something that my successors will have to pay considerable attention to. Um, but I think that it's been the case, at least for the last number of years, that OMB directors have paid a lot of attention. OMB deputy directors have paid a lot of attention. The Y2K crisis was unique in that it was driving to a single date. If we didn't take care of it w with a clock ticking down, we faced potentially very severe consequences. The longer term problems don't have that kind of a neat deadline where a crisis uh, approach is going to be the most effective. I believe what we, we need to do is have an ongoing effort where we don't say it's going to be a year effort or a two-year effort. 
I have absolute confidence that computer technology 10 years from now will be far, far ahead of anything I could predict. Uh, that's been the history of information technology. We can't do it once and then say we're done. It has to become a process and it's going to be expensive. It involves the way agencies work and agency resources. I think it's kind of central to how we do the business that we do. I don't disagree with you in terms of the fact that we need to pay very, very serious attention to it, but I believe we have. And, and that we need to continue to do so, if anything, more so. Thank you very much for that series of questions. We'll uh, now have 15 minutes, since Mr. Turner had 15 minutes, and we'll get back to 10 minutes. Uh, let me go through a few of these other things so we uh, don't uh, forget them. In uh, OMB's fiscal year 1999 performance report, you identified a goal of, quote, working with all agencies to assure that their financial systems comply with the Federal Financial Management Improvement Act of 1996, unquote. Last week, the Controller General of the United States testified that 19 of the 22 agencies that had submitted audit reports did not comply with the act. Now, considering this lack of compliance with this law, could you give me some feeling of what the Office of Management and Budget is doing to achieve that goal? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, we uh, we uh, obviously have set goals for ourselves in this and a number of other areas to try and stretch to do the very best we can. I think we've made a lot of progress. We did better this year than last year. Uh, we need to do better next year than we did this year. Uh, the process of doing the audited financial statements has been a difficult one. Uh, it, it, it was the first time in the, in the history of our government that we did this kind of stock taking. And I think it's enormously important for agencies to get their hands on doing this right. Uh, to, to understand where your assets are and what your resources are is key to making policy judgments. And uh, there have been many instances where if agencies had a better handle on their on their financial statements, they could have solved some of their own problems without having to come to Congress, without uh, necessarily uh, needing to make some other policy decisions that they made. Um, the fact that we, are, we still have a ways to go is something that we've acknowledged uh, clearly. Uh, the fact that we've made progress is something that we've also, I think, pointed out, and I think the GAO has also pointed out. The, uh, the well, General I, can speak I commend to you and uh, the Office of Management and Budget on uh, the results-oriented legislation of 93-94, which was truly bipartisan in terms of the Congress. And uh, when do you think that these agencies will be in full compliance with the Act? We gave them five years to give us a balance sheet with the 96 fiscal year. Then they've had a chance at 97, 98. This is now 99. How do you think we're going to uh, get full compliance? And do they take this seriously? Yes, they do take it seriously, Mr. Chairman, and we take it seriously. If you look at our priority management objectives, this is right up there uh, on our list of priority management objectives. Um, we are going to continue to stretch to try and do it as quickly as possible. And uh, I'm going to uh, hesitate to give you any kind of a date uh, because, frankly, it'll be beyond my term as director, and that's for whoever sits here next to, to, to make a commitment on. I think we have performed well in terms of making progress. Uh, I'm disappointed you know, that it's a difficult process, uh, but I think we all know it's a difficult process. And one can face a difficult challenge like that by saying uh, you can't do it in two years or five years, therefore it's not important. Or you can say we've made a lot of progress over five years and we'll make a lot more progress over the next five years. Okay. Ten years have passed since the enactment of the Chief Financial Officers Act, and that also was a bipartisan act, just as was Inspector Generals and uh, Chief Information Officers. As you can see from the report card, which we issued last week, 17 out of the 22 federal agencies reported one or more material or significant weaknesses. And as you noted in your testimony, the Office of Federal Financial Management exists for the purpose of developing financial management policies. What is the office doing to address the serious problems of poor internal control throughout the government? Practically every agency is inadequate in the internal controls. And in, I don't know if you can, let's move it closer to the director so he can see it. I'm afraid it would have to be a it's, lot closer to be able to read it. <laughs> we've got little charts around here, but they sure haven't uh, increased in the size, so any of us can read it. But uh, move it up closer so he I, can, I see can see it. I can see it. Thanks. Yeah. 
just keep moving it about five that, feet. I think that the uh, the the whole approach uh, to to solving a problem like. Uh, uh, financial management, having uh, a situation where agencies do have internally uh, consistent controls is one that is, it's going to take some time. I, I, I have personally some questions about whether the grades are right or wrong. This isn't the place to go through line by line and, and question. Well, but actually, I don't challenge, we'd, yeah. we'd welcome OMB's uh, giving us some standards. We're hoping to work with you on the computer security thing by agreeing on some standards that reasonable people uh, could do in order to solve the computer security thing, which is a major situation that faces this country. Well, we, we obviously, as, as you know, are working with the agencies trying to develop a coordinated approach. I think to have a single set of standards may not be the right approach there because the standards would evolve and change as, as the threats change. But the protocols in terms of individual uh, responsibility for their computers, agency responsibilities for having systems in place, coordination with the private sector. One of the things that was interesting, a few weeks ago, the president had a conference on, on uh, internet security. And there was a very interesting uh, spirit of cooperation that was cautious but optimistic. The government would be a good partner in, in not telling the private sector exactly what had to be done in the area of internet security. It's a different world when we're interconnected, and and we have to be careful not to impose such rigid requirements that they spill over and, and impede the private sector's ability to deal with many of these problems. And we're working with them, and there's a cooperative, voluntary working arrangement that I think is very promising. But I think we have to be careful about being too rigid about it, or we could we could kind of chill. Well, we'd welcome you know what your standards yeah. are and take a look at it. Uh, we're not wedded to uh, the grading. We do grade on an absolute. It is not a relative <laughs> little curve here. I mean, you know, this is, you can be all A's or all F's, and right now we have a real problem. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, we've made a lot of progress in terms of the audited financial statements. The need for better internal controls is one that we share. I mean, we, I, I don't think that we would question the need to have better internal controls, but we've gone from, I think, a situation that was quite uh, uh, behind where it should be to a situation that I think is perhaps a little bit farther along than this set of grades suggests, and the direction we have to keep continuing, making improvements. I well, mean, I, I would hope we could work together on this, and I mean, it, the, the, the notion of, of doing it on a report card basis, I guess, has a, yeah. a certain kind of... Uh, well, it brings, it hones it on people. Some of my friends in the cabinet have tapped their Y2K report card on their door to shake <laughs> their bureaucracy. So, uh, I don't think there's any question that we want to work together on developing better internal uh, financial controls, and, uh, and we, we view that as something that's not a partisan issue. It's something that we, we should have a shared... Just uh, good government. Just good government, yeah. Uh, last week, the Comptroller General also testified before the subcommittee that agency financial systems overall are in poor condition, cannot produce consistent and reliable financial information to manage day-to-day -day government operations, and that it took heroic efforts for agencies to obtain clean opinions. Now, given those statements by the Attorney General, Controller General, how can you say that agencies have improved their financial information, and what is OMB doing to address the issue? Well, I, I would note that more agencies have clean opinions, more of them have timely clean opinions, and some of the agencies that have yet to get clean opinions are a lot closer. Um, I'd rather succeed in a heroic effort than fail to try. <laughs> well, we agree with that. Uh, Boy Scout uh, values are very good. I'm all for them. The Debt Collection Improvement Act, dear to my heart, uh, passed in, enacted in 1996, requires agencies to forward delinquent debt to the Treasury Department. The subcommittee has concerns because many agencies are doing a poor job submitting this debt for collection. This is money owed the taxpayer. What is the OMB operation doing to facilitate the referral of the billions of dollars of delinquent debt to the Treasury for collection? We have, over the last number of years, been trying to work quite broadly to improve our debt collection practices. We worked with the Congress on a number of occasions uh, on legislation that gave us tools that were more effective. In this last set of appropriations bills, uh, in the area of, of student loan debt collection, we had an important provision, uh, which we very much supported, uh, that would permit us to, to, to be much more aggressive. Um, it, we have a, a, a kind of structural uh, problem in debt collection that agencies uh, in the past haven't felt terribly, uh, they haven't felt the direct incentive to collect debt. 
it didn't affect their program yeah. you know, one way or the other. It was a burden, it was something that was not very popular in the community that they were working in. And I think it is an area where we, working with this committee and others, have really had to be very aggressive saying, we just have the same obligation here that we have in terms of collecting uh, taxes that are due and that private uh, uh, lenders have collecting uh, loans that are due. It's just not an acceptable standard that you can ignore the need to, for debts to be properly paid. I think we've made progress. We've made progress in terms of some assets, uh, the, you know, w w the, the defaulted loans. Um, we've made progress in the student loan area. Uh, the 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 uh, the challenge is one that I think we at OMB, uh, this committee, the, the 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 appropriators with their broader view of government see more clearly than some of the constituent parts do. And and uh, I would hope it's an area we could continue to work together on a bipartisan basis because whether you believe in a big government or a small government, I think we all believe that people who make a commitment to repay should keep the commitment and there should be consequences. In terms of the mechanisms we use, I mean, the, the new higher database being made available for uh, student loan uh, debt collection is an enormously powerful new tool. On the other hand, we have to be careful not to so burden the new higher database that it becomes an unsustainable uh, device uh, to use for its basic purpose, which is child support enforcement. Uh, suggestions have been made over the years that uh, we be more aggressive in terms of using the Treasury IRS process. We're very worried that you have to be careful how you do that. The Treasury is very worried that, that in a system of voluntary tax compliance, if you go too far in that area, you may have a, a problem in terms of voluntary tax compliance that is greater than the debt collection benefit. Uh, I think these are areas we have to proceed in aggressively but carefully, and uh, and I have I have been very focused on this myself, just because it just it, it is one of the good government things we ought to do. If you believe that the government should be making small business loans, then defaulted small business borrowers should be required to either repay or the assets should be sold, and the government should be in the position a bank would be in. Yeah. And we're moving in that direction. We are doing better. Well, I'm glad to hear it because uh, it's long overdue and it goes back uh, to about 1991 with uh, the Internal Revenue Service where they started getting about $100 billion that they claimed they couldn't collect. And uh, I think a lot has to be done by the authorizing committees here. Uh, we've mostly, in the 96 Act, handled the non-tax debt because right. there were little problems of jurisdiction. But uh, let me move to the Government Performance and Results Act, which uh, OMB was very helpful on, and that, again, was a bipartisan bill in 1993. Uh, in your opinion, have the federal agencies met the performance goals listed in the performance plans? What do you think about it? Well, I think some have, some haven't, but I, I, I don't believe that meeting the goals 100% is necessarily the right measure. If every agency met the goals, I think it would tell us that the goals were set in a way too conservative and constrained a manner. The goals are meant to force agencies in the direction that they should be moving. It ought not to be set at a safe level where they're 100% sure that they'll meet them. Um, the idea of stretching to meet goals is as important as having 100% success meeting the goals. And I think the agencies are taking it very seriously. I've noticed in the last, we, we have tried to integrate review of, of these performance measures with the budgetary reviews because that's the way to really get the sense of not just how are we doing on a numerical basis, but what, is, what does it mean in terms of the, of, of the real programmatic res, you know, results. And it's been impressive to me that uh, we've, we've moved, in a lot of cases, from very soft uh, output, well, first input measures, to output measures, to outcome measures, where agencies are coming in with much more clearly defined senses of uh, how many units of progress they expect to make. And I don't oh. think they should be expected to get 100%. Well, I agree. Uh, is there a unit in OMB that can help the agencies in terms of figuring out measurements of either surveys of citizens so they'd know whether they're getting, let's say, certain types of nutrition or not? And it seems to me, you know, the financial indicators really don't mean a thing. 
but the delivery is what counts, and are we trying to make change and help people? How are those measures? Does OMB have any little unit? That well, I, I would say that this? it's a combination of a, a unit and the whole organization. The deputy director for management has the lead working on, on this issue. And in order to really get into the programmatic details, it means drawing on the resources of our resource management organizations and working together. I think we've overcome some of the, the kind of cultural or jurisdictional barriers that may have existed 10 years ago in asking questions like this. I mean, it, it, if you asked a, a, a program examiner uh, what, whether he needed any help or she needed any help in this, they say, that's what we do in the first place. If you ask someone 10 years ago, is that the way budgetary reviews were done, they'd say they're measuring inputs, not outcomes, not outputs. I think we're now in a, in a, in a place where the people who have the detailed programmatic knowledge of what's going on in terms of interdiction of drugs, what's going on in terms of achieving higher nutritional levels, and the people who have experience working uh, on conceptual approaches to measurement and management are teaming together and, and we're working with the agencies and making real progress. Each and every review we did last year, we had discussions that were much better than any of the discussions we'd had uh, in the six reviews that I've been through. And uh, it's not for lack of interest because you know my predecessors as director were as interested as I, but we've made progress. It's, it, it's, it's mo much, much more progress to be made. I'm glad to hear that, and I now yield uh, 10 minutes for questioning to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jack, if you excuse me, I want to go back to the subject we discussed earlier. Uh, when we, when I ask you to describe the uh, Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, I think I and you identified that as the office that is charged with information uh, technology management, along with a host of other responsibilities that you mentioned. Um, you know, I, I've always been a big fan of the, the effort the vice president made in reinventing government. And uh, I, I was particularly interested in that because when that effort was initiated, um, some of the ideas we had implemented in Texas uh, on electronic benefit transfer on the food stamp program uh, were looked at by that working group. And it was sort of the point at which from the best of my recollection, the federal government began to move forward in what they had seen that we'd already done in Texas, where we had been an advocate of using the smart card for food stamps way ahead of any other state in the nation. And my impression was that because the vice president's emphasis on reinventing government was put in place at the federal level, some new ideas flowed into the federal government and allowed us to make some improvements. Information technology, as we all know, holds the opportunity for both the public and private sector to make vast improvements in the way we deliver services. And for the federal government, we know it's going to make it more accountable. It can make it more consumer, customer friendly. Uh, it can make it more accessible to the public. It can make it uh, more efficient, uh, more cost effective. Uh, the benefits uh, are numerous, and I really am interested in trying to uh, uh, work with you to be sure that we can accomplish this goal of gaining a greater emphasis on information technology than we currently have. And I'm not much to predict the future, but I would be very surprised if whoever is elected the next president of the United States doesn't have a an aggressive initiative on the utilization of information technology in the federal government. And the question that I'm trying to anticipate is how do we structure that so that it works well, so it's more than, than uh, window dressing, so that the actual structure of that effort works within the framework of the federal government. One question I want to ask you specifically, uh, if you could describe for me, what is the current relationship uh, between the OMB and the CIO Council, if there is any relationship. Well, o OMB is is the chair of the CIO Council. Um, it was, it, we, we, without an, uh, without a, a, a confirmed DDM, we're doing things on an acting basis, but uh, but we, we do chair the council. 
and I think the CIO Council has been a very useful um, uh, arena for having these conversations. The, the, the guidance that I just sent out uh, regarding uh, uh, computer security was very much a subject of discussion at the CIO Council. Drafts were circulated and discussed, uh, and it was, it was a forum for working through uh, some of these very difficult issues. Um, I think that your characterization of my response on your, your first question on OIRA was a little bit, if, if, if I created the wrong impression, I'd like to correct it. OIRA coordinates many of the information technology issues, but by no means has sole responsibility at OMB. Let me give you three examples of where OMB's resources were drawn on broadly. EBT, I mentioned earlier, where we had our resource, ma resource management office working with the DDM and OIRA. It was a real collaborative task force effort working with the agencies. Uh, tax system modernization, working with you know, our general government division, coordinating with the agency, with OIRA's expertise. Um, the, 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 the problems that we've had over the years at HICFA with their computer system. Uh, our health division was very much involved. I think that one of the things that OIRA has the ability to do, and the deputy director for management, more importantly, has the ability to do, is to draw broadly on all of OMB's resources. And to, we have the, the capacity that is unequaled in the federal government to reach into agencies and work with them to help solve these kinds of complicated problems. I'm afraid that if you set somebody up in an independent office, they just couldn't do that. Or if they did, they would be doing it in a way that, that was less efficient. Um, I'm never comfortable when questions of, of this come up because I don't think we should be turfy about these discussions. If the best way to do it is to have an independent office, I would say that. I don't think in this case that that's correct. I, I believe that if there is a problem with how OMB is doing it, then we ought to solve that problem by giving it the proper place in our priorities. But I think to, to, to separate it from OMB would be to weaken our ability to get our hands on, uh, on the problem. And that doesn't mean that there can't be advisors in other places. Surely, on many issues, you know, we coordinate with the National Economic Council, the Domestic Policy Council. Uh, there are numerous areas where we have core responsibility where we coordinate with other policy offices that report to the president. Um, but I think this is a little different than most of those in that it's kind of cross-cutting. It's fundamental to what we are going to be doing as managers of the federal government over the coming decades. And I think to suggest that you could separate it from other management and budget uh, concerns almost ha has the effect of, of, of putting it more at risk. And I, would, I know that's not your objective. I'm, I'm giving you my frank uh, view of, of, of the tools that we have. And I would welcome, and I'm sure that uh, in the coming years, my sec successors will welcome you know, the advice on how to do it better. Well, and I, and I certainly don't mean to leave the impression that I suggest that we separate it uh, any more than John Koskin's office was separated from the OMB. What I'm looking for is a, an individual who can elevate the profile of information technology, who has a unique background and expertise in the area. Um, John Koskin seemed to fit perfectly for the job he was given. But when we talk about the subject of information technology, I suspect if we reviewed your background or the background of the director of management, you would not find the background that I'm looking for. And I think not only are we talking about background, but we're talking about profile. Uh, I, I'm looking for a structure that would enable uh, the federal government to place an emphasis on moving aggressively in the area of information technology. Uh, I get the impression that one of the roles that the OMB performs rather well is the implementation of current laws that have impact in information technology. Um, your oversight role uh, in implementing federal law is, of course, uh, critical. Uh, but I don't see a long-term uh, emphasis on information technology policy of the nature that I think we need to see in the federal government. And I think a structure, an individual, an office directly accountable to the president uh, can be the spark plug that's needed to allow uh, aggressive 
implementation of information technology. And I agree that we need, as you shared with me, the OMB has the overview to look across agencies. This individual needs to have that ability. It needs to, that person needs to be able to look into the uh, Department of Human Services and say, I see some areas there where we can imp implement um, information technology uh, in a way that perhaps we can do it uh, uh, immediately. We can do it uh, in that agency perhaps better than we come, can some other, and that person can make the decision to say, we're going to move aggressively in this agency for this reason and then perhaps establish a model or a pattern that then later other agencies can follow. So it's, it's that kind of overview that I'm looking for, but it's also a, a, an elevation of the profile of the issue is what I, that I'm looking for. I think it's important to separate uh, the question of profile and expertise from from uh, the tools that we have. Um, in terms of, of profile, to some extent, that's something that one could change. Uh, I, I think that if you look at my predecessor, uh, by establishing as one of his major areas of concerns, putting rules out that govern information technology procurement, he was asserting that that was a central OMB responsibility. One of the decisions I made when I took over was to be focused very much on the implementation of those rules. It was very clear that it was a question I was going to ask at every single budget review, and that word went through our organization, it went back to the agencies, and it was part of our discussion of every agency's budget requests. The Klinger Cohen Act was something we worked very closely with the Congress on, and that was a law that was an important law, where we played a, a I hope, creative and helpful role working with the Congress, uh, who ultimately has responsibility for making the law. Um, I know John Koskinen pretty well, and don't believe that on paper his background is as a computer uh, expert either. He brought a special set of, uh, of personal background in terms of crisis management, knowledge of OMB as former deputy director for management, and he was given uh, the, 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 the task to generate the kind of public profile because it was as much a public education effort as it was a management uh, responsibility. Uh, I think if you're looking in the long term, um, I would question whether sustaining it as a crisis is the right approach. I think we have to make it something that's just core and central to how we manage. And that, I think, is quite central to our traditional roles at OMB in terms of both management and traditionally being responsible for information technology. So I, I, I think we share a common goal. I don't, I don't think that, that, that I, there's disagreement that this is an area of enormous importance for the level of, of, of attention that you're describing. I think we just need to work together thinking through what the pros and cons of different approaches are. I've made clear my, my own view, but, uh, but I'm delighted to continue to work with you on this. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, we have now 10 minutes of questioning. Uh, just to round out a few things and then get back to Mr. Turner. The uh, standards that uh, I take it you will look for on computer security. Uh, will you look at what a, an agency really needs to have in this area? And if you are going to do that, obviously we think that's a great idea and you ought to get quarterly reports and we'd like to look at them just as we did under the Y2K situation. So what's your feeling on that? Can well, we count we on OMB for standards in this area? And about when will they be put together? Uh, it, on February 28th, we send out guidance to the departments with uh, both a set of principles and uh, a set of policies uh, in terms of how they should incorporate uh, computer security into into a, their plan. Could um, we uh, put that in the record yeah, at this be happy point to. without uh, objection? Be happy to. Fine. And, uh, I, I think that regular reporting uh, is important. Integrating it with the, the budgetary decisions in terms of the IT budgets is important. Um, whether it's quarterly or some other period uh, is something that I think we need to, to work over time to, 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 to determine the right uh, f uh, f yeah, frequency. In uh, our general management situation on the goals under the Performance Act, uh, I looked at page 17 on Appendix 3 in the 99 Performance Report, and you checked off that you'd accomplished your goal of, quote, continuously working with agencies to improve management practices throughout the government, unquote. 
and is that, I guess I ask you, is that a measurable goal? And if so, how are you planning to see that that checked off item uh, really has some teeth in it and where it would be accomplished, as it says here? I'm dubious on that. That's why I'm bringing it up to see if we can get a little focus. Well, it, it, it is, uh, I think, there's, again, it goes back to whether the, the efforts we have that are government-wide and the efforts that are agency-specific. On a government-wide basis, the things that we're doing in information technology, the things that we're doing in financial management, uh, while we have ways to go to achieve our goals, I think we're making progress. We've discussed those uh, at some length already. Uh, with specific agencies, our, our 24 priority management objectives, well, 12 of them are, you know, are, are very much focused on specific undertakings with agencies. And I get regular reports on those and uh, on not an infrequent occasion work with heads of agencies on those. And I think we're making progress. Uh, you know, I'm very proud of the work we've done with the INS to try and take a backlog that was really, really unconscionable and turn it around. It didn't happen by accident. It happened because of serious top level attention by myself, by the Attorney General, and it's not a problem entirely solved, but it's substantially uh, remediated. Uh, you know, I, I can go through other examples as well. I, I think... Well, on that, how much credit would you give OMB versus giving Charles Rosati as commissioner? No, I was saying INS, not IRS. Oh, you said, yeah, okay, yeah. I thought you said uh, IRS. But, you know, in the case of IRS, we've worked with, obviously, Charles Rosati is an excellent commissioner, but we've worked closely on many issues, helping them to get a handle on, on their own uh, internal management issues. He brought with him the kind of expertise that you, you know, are, are lucky to bring into government in terms of com you know, technolo information technology. Uh, but even there, we work closely with him to make sure that the benchmarks required would be met and, uh, and that it wasn't going to be a repeat of past problems, which were very serious. Well, since you brought up INS, and I am a Californian and a border state, if you will, uh, what do you think uh, needs to be done now? Do we need more agents? Is OEM? and be willing to uh, recommend to the president that uh, that happen. I remember in 94, I remember as a freshman making a speech on the subject that hadn't been made before, believe it or not, and uh, we authorized a lot of people, and it took forever to educate them, train them, because you can't just take anybody that's in enforcement and put them on the border. They need to know languages, they need to understand and be sensitive to what the situation is there. Well, the priority management objective I was referring to had to do with the naturalization side of INS. You're asking about the border control piece of it. I think that, uh, that there have been a number of difficulties. You know, setting a goal of hiring uh, new agents uh, is one part of it. Actually being able to recruit and train the agents is another, and we're in an economy where we're competing with many other agencies and many other entities as we try to recruit people for those jobs, and there are many slots that it's been difficult to fill. We've made suggestions in the budgets of the last few years, which unfortunately have not been funded, but I think would very much enhance the efficiency of border control. Have they been asked for yes, in we've the budget? Yes, we have requested for several years now um, things to augment human uh, you know, agents on the border. For example, there are technologies uh, where posting of cameras at uh, you know, frequent, regular frequency along the border and having SWAT teams that come in when there's a problem is a way of leveraging our personnel to cover the border more effectively. That's not been funded. So I hope we can work together on well, things like that. definitely. And please file for the record at this point in the record, and I'll go making uh, the various I'd be delighted cardinals to. see what they're I'd doing. I'd be delighted to. I, I think that is, it, it, it's both cheaper because it, you, know, it, you have a camera instead of a, an FTE, but when you don't have the FTEs and you can't recruit them, you have to be more efficient in how you uh, use your resources apart from just the money. Let me move to the Privacy Act. Now, you're aware of the, I think OMB has still a responsibility for implementation, don't they, of the Privacy Act? Yes. Yeah. Are you aware of the extraordinary backlogs that exist and the some of the agencies in responding to requests for information under the law? In other words, it isn't months, it's years. What do, what do we know about that and what's OMB doing about it? Uh, I think that the issue is more what's happening in the agencies than what's happening at OMB. We get several thousand uh, 
I believe, you know, filings, which would, you know, th th submissions from the agencies. I'm not aware of backlogs of that sort, but I'd be happy to go back and. Well, uh, when we had a them. hearing several years ago, there was a four year wait to get your file from the FBI. Now, I know they've put more resources on that, and we haven't scheduled that hearing yet, but uh, I would appreciate it if yeah. OMB took a look at it and uh, provided in recommending in the president's budget uh, to get the resources so citizens can know what's in government files and not be put off by four years. We even asked him if, suppose a member of Congress asked that, yeah, you'd take, we'd give you four years too. And so finally the excuse was, well, if you have a hearing about it, and so I filed on that and we got the files. But, you know, do we have to hold a hearing for every American in order to see what's going on? Yeah, I, I think that uh, our role is, a, is a, at, a, at a more general level where we, we, we have guide, set guidelines and, and generally review. Um, I, I will have to go back and, uh, and, and get some more information about the backlogs that may be happening at the okay. agency. Well, I'd appreciate it. In the absence of the Deputy Director for Management, who chairs the President's Management Council? Um, the deputy director uh, designate is, is serving as acting, but all the official functions are handled by a confirmed official. Okay, I just wanted that. It, it's uh, not an ideal arrangement. <laughs> in the record, I can imagine. Yeah. In OMB's fiscal uh, year, uh, have we handled that enough, do you think? Okay, and I've only got a minute and a half. So uh, let me ask, what's your view of the proposal that I'm proposing on an Office of Management separate from the Office of Budget with both directors reporting to the President? And one of the reasons for this is that we need people who are directors who know something about the field. And we have very few directors of the budget that have ever dealt in major management situations, never headed a huge consulting firm, let's say, that does this regularly for corporate America. So uh, give me your best shot at that. I think that the, the the benefits from keeping management and budget together far outweigh any of the benefits that you might get from having separate individuals who are chosen for expertise in budget or management to head either. Uh, it, it is inherent to the job of OMB director that uh, you will spend a lot of your time working on things you never worked on before. There's no person who could come uh, with prior knowledge of every agency of government, every program of government, and the management issues are not different from the budget issues in that regard. Uh, the OMB director couldn't do the job of OMB director if not supported by an excellent staff. And I go back to the career staff, which is the heart and soul of OMB. We have the most talented group of people in government working for OMB. Uh, they are treasure, and we work constantly to strengthen that. Um, I think to take the function of management and separate it would be to separate it from the tools that we have to focus attention on management issues. And I'll go back to something I said a little earlier. Uh, the, the, the imperative of obtaining funding, both in the president's budget and in the appropriations process, focuses the minds of agencies, unlike most other uh, policy deliberations. I don't believe a director for management without the budget function would have the same ability to work with agencies on issues that agencies would just as soon not have help with sometimes. And I, I think it's very important to keep them together. I used, I used to agree with you on that. And when I had been on President Nixon's White House task force, but not on this one, but I thought, boy, what a great idea. They can use the budget to get some changes in management. When I got back here, it was very clear, my friends who were senior civil servants and real career people, they said, look, nothing's happening over there. They're not using that power. So if you have a list of things where you've used the budget to solve a management thing, I'm glad to put it in the record at this point. I think that the, I, I, there are examples of that, but that, I think that more important than the use of it is the threat of it. Uh, you don't want to have the budget process used to force management change. What you want is to have a process where you get agencies to focus on management problems, solve them, and to do it in a collegial way. I, it may perhaps be my philosophy of OMB and how the, the director of OMB should function, but in general, I think you get a lot more done by working with people than by holding a club over their head. But having the club in your back pocket is very useful. I now yield 11 minutes to my colleague from Texas, Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to go back uh, and just round out a couple of things that might be helpful to, to me. 
um, you acknowledge that the OMB chairs the CIO Council, and I was asking about the relationship between OMB and um, the CIO Council. And I, what I was really looking for is, is what has resulted from the relationship between the CIO Council and OMB. And for, I don't know, how often do they meet together? How, how often does the CIO Council? Uh, it's a monthly meeting. The meeting. Yeah. Maybe the best way to get at this, does the CIO Council meeting, do they have minutes of what takes place at the meeting? Um, I have people report to me on what happens at the uh, meetings, but I haven't seen minutes per se. If there are, uh, yeah, I, I don't see them. Maybe it would be helpful to me if, if I could just request, uh, with Chairman's permission, uh, copies of any minutes or any reports that relate what kind of discussion has taken place at these meetings, these monthly me meetings, since the CIO Council has been in existence. Because yes. that, I think, would be helpful. Uh, I'm not sure that we have minutes in a formal sense, but we'd be happy to get back to you with a description of things that uh, the CIO Council has, has worked on and deliberated. Uh, my, my expectation is that we will read a lot about discussions on current law, discussions about procurement, uh, maybe even some general discussions about the problems of computer security. Uh, I'm, I suspect that I will not find the kind of forward thinking uh, initiatives and discussions on uh, long-term use of information technology that I'm concerned about. But um, if you could provide me with that or the committee, that would be helpful to me to read that. Uh, with, without objection, that'll be in the record available to all members, and starting with Mr. Turner. Uh, the other request that I would have that I think would be helpful to me is to see um, the documentation, copies of uh, any reports, memos, et cetera, that exist within OMB, at least for the last year, that would reflect specific proposals, recommendations, or initiatives for long-term utilization of information technology in order to make government more accountable, more open, more efficient, more cost-effective, those kinds of documents so I can get a good picture of what OMB is actually doing uh, in terms of actual initiatives or proposals for the use of, the greater use of information technology. I'd be happy to respond for the record in more detail, but let me just note sort of preliminarily that the, the way the, the CIO Council is organized, there are committees that work in a number of areas. There's a security committee, an interoperability committee, a, uh, an e-gov committee, and, and there are efforts underway in each of these areas to have collaborative thinking about the future, and I'd be happy to, to, to get back to you. I, I'm not sure what formal documentation we have, but I'd be happy to respond to what I understand to be your inquiry, what are we doing? And, and keep in mind, I'm, I'm interested in what the CIO Council is doing, but these committees that you're referring to within the CIO Council might be uh, sort of many think tanks. No, these are these are program people who run their information offices. This is not a think tank group. These 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 are people with you know, you know real responsibilities to implement. Right, I understand that. But uh, you know, my greater concern is where is the uh, point within the federal government where we have the ability to actually initiate uh, change with regard to the utilization of information technology. And uh, I agree with you that this has got to be a partnership between these agency CIOs and the OMB. And I, I agree with many of your points, Mr. Liu, about the relationship between budget and management, because we're talking about dollars. In order to give uh, anyone uh, in a position of a special assistant to the president on information technology the ability to do anything, they're going to have to have some funds where they can direct it toward an agency to initiate some information technology improvement. Uh, so those issues certainly are linked. Uh, but I think it would be helpful to me to see what the work product has been uh, with regard to specific recommendations for change, initiatives uh, that are occurring and that are flowing from OMB uh, out to these CIOs or to the agencies themselves. And that will give me a little bit of a better feel and understanding of, of where I think we might need to go. Be happy to respond. Thank you very much.
Are you done, Jim? Yes, thank you. Okay, I thank the gentleman uh, for an excellent series of questions, and I thank you, Mr. Director. Uh, sorry to keep you so long, but uh, My pleasure. we had a lot of things to ask about, and uh, you did a very good job. Thank you. These are very important questions that I think are central uh, to what we do at OMB and what, uh, you know, in the long term, uh, the issues that we appropriate on every year are less important than some of these broader questions, which have to do with the direction that we're going and the challenges to keep the, the forest uh, in mind as we're as we're pruning each of the trees. Glad to have you here. We now have panel two, which is the Honorable David M. Walker, Controller General of the United States. Uh, General, if you uh, stand and raise your right hand, we'll swear you in. You swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give the subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. I do, Mr. Chair. Clerk will note, Controller General has affirmed the oath, and please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Turner. Appreciate the opportunity to appear again before the subcommittee. This is getting to be a regular occurrence. I think it was last Friday that I was here as well, uh, last. I might uh, note that uh, I would like to commend this committee at the outset for its continued focus on important management issues, uh, and its willingness to lead by example in this regard, uh, and its willingness to work on Fridays. Uh, and I can assure the taxpayers of the United States that uh, they are getting their money's worth with regard to uh, this subcommittee, and I, I commend you uh, for your combined efforts. I have mixed emotions about appearing uh, at this hearing, and I say that for several reasons. First, we have an ongoing and constructive working relationship with OMB in order to try to be able to uh, address a number of challenges that face government and in order to maximize the performance and assure the accountability of government for the benefit of the American people. I can note at the outset that just as GAO has a number of dedicated and hard-working professionals that OMB does as well in the area of management. Uh, however, at the same point in time, I would note that they do not have a confirmed leader as Deputy Director of Management, which is a, a major uh, problem and obstacle. Uh, and secondly, that they need to have more people uh, focused on management, and they need to spend more time uh, dealing with a number of major management issues. Mr. Chairman, we believe that the nation is at an important crossroads. As you know, the Cold War is over and we won. In addition, we are not fighting annual battles over budget deficits every year. At the same point in time, this is the time that we need to start asking ourselves not only what government does, but how government does business. And it's the second issue that this hearing is about, how government does business. Our recent strategic plan demonstrates that many of the challenges that face the nation are of growing complexity and interdependency, and that in fact they have no boundaries. They have no boundaries globally, domestically, or within the government, uh, either in the executive branch or the legislative branch. While in de the individual departments agencies and program managers have the primary responsibility for strategic planning and management. It is critically important that OMB play a role in addressing current and emerging issues of importance, high-risk areas, and cross-cutting government-wide issues. Uh, in some ways, OMB is uniquely positioned to be able to address government-wide management issues because they have the ability to leverage the budget process to assure that they get people's attention. Because as we know, Mr. Chairman, he or she who controls the money, you better take seriously. But just having that ability has to be followed up by exercising and having accountability and consequences periodically in order for people to take it seriously. In OMB's discharging its responsibility, it's important that they serve in a variety of roles. They need to be a motivator, they need to be a facilitator, they need to be an integrator, and yes, Mr. Chairman, at times they need to be an enforcer, and they need to assure that there are consequences if appropriate actions aren't taken. 
While OMB has taken a number of steps in this regard, much more needs to be done in the management areas. Uh, in addition, for example, the management issues, a range of critical management issues, need to be an integral and ongoing part of the annual budget process. And individuals with management expertise in the relative areas need to be at the table at the time that these issues are considered as part of the annual budget process. For example, Mr. Chairman, as you know, uh, to OMB's credit, uh, they have identified a number of priority management objectives, PMOs. In many cases, these uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, common commonality between their PMOs and our high risk list or our major management challenges and program risk. They are not synonymous. There are some gaps, but there are a lot. Of, there's a lot of overlap. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot of these PMOs, priority management objectives, uh, are n do not have clearly defined nor measurable goals. And so therefore, it's very difficult to ascertain progress and to know when success truly has been achieved. You've pointed to the most recent uh, report that OMB issued, which is the government-wide performance plan. And I would note that if you look at a lot of the measures there, a lot of their measures are that they're working with. Well, working with is good, but that's not a result. And it's important that we have clearly defined and measurable outcomes being the focus of what we're trying to achieve in a more results-oriented government. In addition, OMB does not have enough people with the right skills to focus on certain critical management challenges. For example, strategic planning, change management, information technology, and human capital. These are critical management challenges that require a level of expertise uh, in addition to uh, leadership and other uh, behavioral attributes. Furthermore, OMB needs to expand their horizons as to how they measure success in certain circumstances. For example, GIPRA has to be much more than an annual paperwork exercise. GIPRA is a, must be a foundation, a framework for how government does business every day. It must be a foundation for moving towards more results-oriented and accountable government. The CFO Act is much more than clean opinions. As you pointed out, sound internal controls, compliance with the Federal Financial Management Improvement Act are important because what the CFO Act really is all about is how to assure that we have timely, accurate, useful information to be able to make informed decisions every day. IT is much more than Y2K. Computer security, e-commerce, other issues are critically important as well. And human capital, people, represents the missing link in the government's effort to try to achieve a more results-oriented orientation. We will never maximize the performance and assure the accountability of the federal government for the benefit of the American people unless we spend a lot more time on the people element and OMB has a critical role to play. This cannot be turned over to OPM. They can make contributions, they are making contributions, but this is a strategic issue of major importance uh, to the government and our nation. OMB needs to focus more attention on the broader dimensions of these challenges, and they need to be able to have the human and financial capital to be able to do so. Uh, while OMB needs to focus on a broader range of management issues, uh, there are several models that could be used in order to uh, address these ch different challenges. I note several in my testimony. There are several models that have been used in the past and should be used in the, in the future. Basically, we need to follow the concept, the form that is used must follow the function that is performed. And I will be happy to answer in Q&A some examples of that. In the end, it really doesn't make as much of a difference how one is organized as whether or not you have the absolute commitment from the top, whether you have the people, the processes, and the technology to make it happen and to maximize results and assure accountability. As I've stated before, Mr. Chairman, we've worked in a constructive fashion with OMB in the past, and where we have, considerable progress has been made. For example, Y2K and certain elements of financial uh, management. We will continue to do so in the future, irrespective of OMB's roles and their, their resource allocation. Uh, 
But we do believe that OMB needs to place more emphasis on the M. Uh, we think that's critically important. I would also close by saying, Mr. Chairman, in addition to OMB placing more attention on the M, I think it's also important that Congress pay more attention to the M. And this committee is leading, subcommittee is leading by example in that regard, but much more needs to be done by the Congress uh, in the area of concerted and ongoing oversight uh, in this area as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Be happy to answer any questions you might have. Well, thank you. As usual, you come well prepared and you have a very fine professional force that backs you up in the General Accounting Office. Uh, Director Liu testified that agencies should not be expected to meet all of their stated goals. He also said OMB is making progress coordinating the Results Act implementation. What are your reactions to his comments? Well, first, I think it's important that you set um, stretch but attainable goals. You don't want to set goals that are so easy to meet that they're, uh, they're a layup, if you will. I think you do want to try to stretch people, but you want them to try to be attainable. And therefore, I believe that uh, a vast majority of the goals that you set for a particular year should be achieved. Um, I think progress is, is being made with regard to the Government Performance Results Act, but I don't think that it's anywhere near where it needs to be. I think people are still viewing it too much as an annual paperwork exercise, rather than recognizing that this is the foundation for how they ought to be operating, and, and recognizing that in addition to preparing these plans, they need to effectively change the way they do business consistent with these plans in order to focus more on outcomes rather than outputs, and to focus more on results rather than processes. Have you and your colleagues in the General Accounting Office had a chance to assess OMB's fiscal year 2001 plan and the fiscal year 1999 performance report? Have you had a chance to? Well, we've, uh, we've looked at it on a preliminary basis. Not, uh, we haven't completed it. I would say that the, the, the plan that I just referred to, which is the 2001 plan, that we were, uh, our preliminary viewers were somewhat disappointed. Uh, while clearly they prepared it and it did meet the time frame, uh, some of the goals and measures were not uh, uh, as, as clearly defined uh, and as measurable as, as uh, they should be. And candidly, I question whether they met their own standards for what the agencies are supposed to do. I think it's important for us at GAO, being the lead accountability organization, as well as for OMB, being the representative of the president uh, in this area, to lead by example. And so uh, we haven't finished our review, but there, it's somewhat disappointing. Uh, Director Liu also testified he would not separate management from the Office of Management and Budget because the budget issues drive the management ones. What are your reactions to those comments? Well, Mr. Chairman, I have mixed emotions about uh, whether or not to separate it. Uh, I, I think I care more about uh, the result, uh, and there, there are different what needs to be done rather than how it gets to be done. In theory, in theory, uh, having the ability to, to leverage the budget process is a powerful tool, and if properly exercised, uh, I think uh, is desirable to keep them together. In practice, I think that we've seen uh, that the M has been, uh, has, has been clearly secondary uh, to the B. Uh, and I think there are different ways that we can try to achieve more equilibrium. Uh, I think if, if we don't see more leveraging of the B, then other alternatives need to be looked at. But uh, I care more about focusing more of the right kind of skills and attention on the M than what the organizational structure is. Uh, your uh, shop, the General Accounting Office, has done a marvelous job over the years at the beginning of each Congress to give us a high-risk series. Have, could you sort of summarize the five most important things that the executive branch, regardless of party, uh, you can go back to 91 if you want to, and uh, what is happening on that front? Are they listening to the General Accounting Office, which is part of the uh, legislative branch, and uh, we depend on you uh, very greatly for the fine work that you do. But uh, what about some of these high-risk series? Are they just reports that get their dust for PhD students to analyze, uh, or is the executive branch taking it seriously? 
Well, the OMB has reviewed our high-risk list. They are aware of it. And in fact, with regard to the prior priority management objectives, most of the items, not all, but most of the items that are included in our high-risk list are addressed one way or the other in the priority management objectives. A couple examples of ones that aren't are the farm loan programs and NASA contracting activities would be a couple of examples of ones that aren't included in there. Uh, yes, it's on their radar screen. Uh, as you know, Mr. Chairman, not many of these have come off the high-risk list, not as many as we would like. And in some cases, they represent problems that it took years to create, and it's going to take years to get them off. I do think it's important that as part of the agency's performance plans, and as part of the budgeting process, and as part of the oversight process in Congress, that this be one of the central elements that continually gets focused on uh, as an important area, what type of progress is being made in order to eventually be able to effectively deal with these areas. Uh, would you have a, what are the worst cases that we have? Medicare is certainly one under the high risk bit, uh, but what else is there? Well, there are a number. I mean, computer security is one that I know that is of interest to yourself and Mr. Turner in particular. Uh, that's an area that, quite frankly, I would say is uh, bigger and more important than Y2K. And why do I say that? I say that because, A, it, it relates not just to national security and economic security issues. Those are obviously important in and of themselves, but it also deals with personal privacy. Uh, and when you're talking about health records and financial records and things that, uh, that individuals hold very close and very dear to themselves, that cuts very close to the bone. So uh, that would be another example. Uh, acquisitions, DOD management, whether it be financial management or whether it be acquisitions at DOD, major challenges. Uh, much more needs to be done, and frankly, we're never going to probably get a clean opinion on the government's financial statements until DOD gets its act together. And while DOD is clearly an A in fighting and winning, winning armed confl conflicts, uh, which is their primary mission, uh, they're a D at best with regard to economy and efficiency. Uh, those would be some examples, Mr. Chairman. Well, I'm glad we agree on that. I once held a hearing, what did you do with the $25 billion we can't find? And we gave them a couple of years, and they finally got the inventories maxed with the uh, uh, combined with the uh, various uh, purchase orders and all the rest, and got it down to $10 billion. But you're right, that is a real mess. And the first secretary, Mr. Forrestal, should have said, we're not going to have 149 different accounting systems. We're going to have one. And I don't know how many they've got now. For, for the record, Mr. Chairman, let me say that, that we, we have been uh, somewhat encouraged by uh, what we've seen at DOD over the last year or two. They, they do seem to be taking these issues more seriously, uh, but there's a long way to go. Uh, let me just mention one more question. I'll have Mr. Turner the rest of the time. Uh, please elaborate on the point you made in your written testimony and quote, OMB has not formally assessed the effectiveness of the different approaches taken by its statutory offices to promote the integration of management and budget issues. Unquote. How does this comport with the argument that budget and management must go hand in hand? Well, I think that there has been clearly some linkage in the past. There has been, and we issued a report within, I believe, the last uh, couple of years, Mr. Chairman, uh, looking at to what extent has there been some, some linkage between management and budget issues. And we noted that there had been greater linkage recently than there had been in the past. My point is, is not nearly enough. And there hasn't been enough considered analysis of how best to go about doing that. Uh, which I, I think is important, which is what that comment refers to. I thank you and uh, turn back to my remaining minute and a half and uh, 10 minutes to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Walker, you heard my questions directed to, to Mr. Liu. And um, my first question for you, you've already answered. I was going to ask you if there's a need for greater emphasis on information technology and its utilization, and that was one of, I believe, your four items that you uh, placed as a, uh, areas of great need in our federal government. Um, I, I was looking through your written statement, and it, it's uh, replete with uh, thoughts about the importance of uh, emphasis on information technology. Uh, 
you seem to address uh, the fact that in a, one of your statements is the government's use of information technology has suffered from management weaknesses that have resulted in widespread untapped potential to improve service delivery. And later in your written statement, you began to discuss the various approaches uh, to provide flexibility in addressing management issues. And you list several uh, that I won't go into, but uh, things like the single, single central leader approach, the council approach, the task force approach, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I want to thank you uh, at the outset for the help that uh, your staff has given me. Uh, Dave McClure and Jack Brock have been working with me and, and, and my staff to try to address the issue that I discussed at length with Mr. Liu. And for that, I'm very grateful. They're, they're outstanding individuals, and they bring a lot uh, to the issue. That's been very helpful, and I appreciate them working through this with me, helping me draft some proposals. Um, but let me just ask you, just as a beginning point, if you can articulate uh, your opinion regarding the way OMB addresses uh, the issue of information technology, and in particular, um, is it fulfilling the role uh, of developing and implementing long-term information technology for the federal government? I think this is an area that uh, they have been placing effort on, uh, but frankly, uh, they don't have enough people with the right type of skills uh, to get the job done here. Uh, if you mentioned before about OIRA, for example, uh, the question that Director Liu gave was that OIRA uh, has theoretically responsibility for uh, the information technology area. Uh, at the same point in time, if you listened, which I'm sure you did, to all the different responsibilities that OIRA had, uh, each of which were important, uh, but very diverse uh, responsibilities. And if you then looked at how many people that OIRA has to be able to accomplish those responsibilities, and if you looked at the skills that it takes in order to be successful in addressing each of those, they've got almost an impossible task. We clearly need more focus on information technology, uh, we need more skills in this area. We need to raise the profile uh, of this issue. Uh, but I think that uh, there, are, there, are, there are different ways to accomplish that end. Uh, I think they're trying to do the best with what they have, but we need to do a lot more. In your testimony a moment ago, uh, when you were discussing the ways federal government should address some of these issues, information technology, uh, human capital, and the others that you mentioned. The first thing you said is that there needed to be an absolute commitment from the top. And as you heard from my questions, uh, Mr. Liu, uh, that's really the, where, the place where I began as well, is to try to figure out how we can structure something that would uh, put information technology in the hands of someone uh, who actually had that commitment from the top uh, to do the job of long-term information technology planning and implementation. Um, you have two able staff members working with me, but I, I would invite you if you have any thoughts on how perhaps uh, we should structure um, our approach uh, to dealing with this information technology issue. I've been pretty forthcoming regarding my suggestion. Uh, you've noted the reluctance of OMB uh, with regard to the Koskin type model. Uh, do you have any thoughts? And I don't mean to pin you down. I know this is an evolving thing, even with your staff. But I welcome your your input and your suggestions. Well, let me give you several thoughts, Mr. Turner. First, I think, as I mentioned before, I think form has to follow function. There are various different forms that you can use in order to try to address a management challenge, and they're noted in my my testimony. But part of it has to do with what, what's the function you're trying to achieve. I would say in the information technology area, we have uh, certain short-term needs uh, and certain recurring needs. One of our short-term needs is that we really need to raise the visibility, raise the priority of a range of challenges in the area of information technology. Computer security being one example, uh, and uh, e-commerce uh, possibly being another example. 
they're related but not the same issue. Uh, and therefore, one might say, how best can that be done in order to jumpstart it, in order to get the attention of all the persons within the government, and in some cases outside of the government, that need to be mobilized, which means cabinet officials as well, uh, for example. And so therefore, one might make an argument that there might need to be something, some focal point similar to a John Koskinen type situation uh, in order to get this thing going, and in order to get it focused, and in order to try to achieve certain measurable milestones. However, there clearly is a recurring need uh, in the area of information technology, in the area of knowledge management, for example, within the government. There's clearly a recurring need for a CIO uh, and for that CIO to be able to, to uh, uh, be able to have uh, you know high level of visibility and support, uh, and and that's not something that I think in and of itself you know would necessarily call for the the czar model or the or, or the special assistant to the president model, uh, and so I think that you know you may want to think about the different roles and functions that need to be a, a achieved, and, and and what are we trying to accomplish over what time frame, and there might be more than one model that would make sense. You might uh, depending on the functions that are involved. When you mention the CIO, are you referring to the, the uh, concept of a federal CIO that would have oversight over and a relationship with all of the agency CIOs that are already provided for in present law? That's correct, Mr. Turner. Uh, I mean, that, that is a recurring need. That is a recurring function. Uh, and. Uh, you know, one could argue that, uh, as I think Director Liu did, that you know, whether or not you need a czar type of function, because a lot of the activities that the czar will be doing will be recurring in nature. And unlike Y2K, where you had a date certain and you knew that you were going out of business, uh, you know, shortly after that date certain, either you got it right or you didn't, and you'd know, and there's a market test, and then you could end up closing that down. In the case of some of the activities that, uh, in co computer security and in and, and, and e-commerce, it'll be ongoing, and e-government, it'll be ongoing. At the same point in time, I think that what you can say is, but do you need to do some things differently to get it started, to get it on the right track, and then to put it back to another function, for example, to merge it with the CIO and, and recognize that it's part of an ongoing responsibility, but you might need to do something supplemental uh, in order to jump start it. So maybe a short term, year long mm, effort to place emphasis on it through some special, more high profile type individual, but also in conjunction with that, there should be a federal CIO that would have ongoing continuing responsibility. I think area. you might want to consider that. Now, as far as the length of time and the scope of responsibilities, that's something that obviously deserves additional consideration and deliberation. Uh, it, it's tough to get a whole lot done in a year, I mean, uh, but uh, especially by the time you get, get the thing started. But I think that's something you may want to consider. Now, could the federal CIO and this individual that's going to elevate the profile of the issue for a shorter period of time, could that perhaps be the same person? It, it, it's possible. It's possible it could be the same person. And I think, you know, part of it has to do with uh, what is trying to be accomplished. There, uh, whoever it is, obviously, is going to have to have a tremendous amount of support. Uh, and as I think Director Liu talked about, I mean, John Koskinen is one person. John Koskinen had to have the support of OMB. John Koskinen had to have the support of, you know, the CIOs and all the different departments and agencies. Uh, and uh, ultimately, whoever has this responsibility or these responsibilities is going to have to have some backup support, both within, uh, on a central basis as well as decentralized. Well, as you could tell from Mr. Liu's testimony, it's going to be somewhat. Um, uh, of a, a problem to be sure we structure such a proposal so that we can get, as you pointed out in your written statement, the buy-in of OMB to this idea, as well as the buy-in of the various agencies and the CIOs in those agencies. But I'm confident your staff has the expertise to help us do that, and I, I'd like to um, thank you again for your efforts to move us in that direction. Thank you, Mr. Turner. I, I might also note that while I agree with Director Liu that OMB has outstanding staff, uh, I, I'd, I'd hold the GAO staff up against them. Thank you.
I thank the gentleman uh, for that round of questioning. I think we've gotten very good answers from both you and Mr. Liu. Uh, General, uh, we don't need to detain you any longer since we've had you on a number of committees here and uh, working through the performance issues. And uh, we appreciate very much you coming up. And I particularly enjoyed seeing your accountability study. That is a good masterpiece. And uh, you do have a first-rate staff that does these things. I'm interested, obviously, in the measurement and what is a measurement when we're looking at some of these programs. Uh, to, I asked, did uh, OMB have a unit that was dealing with that? So I might as well ask you, does the General Accounting Office have a unit that is functioning in that area? We have uh, an Office of Quality and Risk Management, that, uh, which that unit combined with our different uh, operating units work together to try to define appropriate measures. And, and you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, that you know, we had we just published our first uh, accountability report, which really probably ought to be called a performance and accountability report. And even in that, while we're trying to lead by example, and we think we are in that report, yeah, there it is. It's even Thank you, Thomas Mr. Jefferson's memorial. Correct. That's right. In fact, it includes a quote from Thomas Jefferson in 1802 on the inside inside cover, talking about the importance of effective federal financial management. It took us a little while. We're still not there yet, but we're we're working on it. That was 1802. Yeah. In fact, uh, uh, here it, here it is. A April 1802, I think, said Thomas Jefferson, it is an object of great importance to simplify our system of finance and to bring it within the comprehension of every member of Congress. The whole system has been involved in impenetrable fog. There is a point on which I should wish to keep my eye, a simplification of the form of accounts so as to bring everything to a single center. He was quite a president. Uh, he was the first one to impound money when he, the Army had too many uh, barrels of oats and uh, not enough horses to eat them up, so he just impounded it. And uh, that's some uh, what presidents ought to have now sometimes. And let me just say that even for our report, while we're very proud of it and we're getting, we're getting a number of positive compliments back, and, and while I might note for the record, Mr. Chairman, I believe on your grading scale we would have gotten an A, and, and of course we wouldn't want anything less than an A, of course. <laughs> Of uh, the fact of the matter is, is that we're constantly looking at how we can revise ours and how we can improve ours, and everybody ought to be doing that. Uh, right. We all need to be doing that. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. We thank you. Thank you very much for coming. We now go to panel three. Mr. James C. Miller III. James C. Miller III, uh, Counselor, Citizens for a Sound Economy. And uh, Mr. Dwight Inc., President Emeritus, Institute of Public Administration, and Herbert Jasper, Senior Associate, McManus Associates. I think there's a sign for each of you. Mr. Jasper's sign is down here. And then Mr. Rink, Mr. Miller, if you'll raise, stand, raise your right hand, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? No, so help me God. The clerk will note that all three witnesses affirm the oath. And we will begin with uh, Mr. James C. Miller III, who is a former director of the Office of Management and Budget from the years 1985 to 1988. And we're delighted to have you here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a, a statement I prepared and given to the They're committee They're all in advance, automatically and I put in the thank record. Thank you very much. And if you could then summarize it, uh, we thank could you. then get to questions. I will thank do that. You. I want to uh, affirm um, a comment I heard from uh, Director Liu. I think the OMB staff, in my judgment, is the best in government. It's the best I've ever seen. Um, and I think, frankly, uh, protecting and preserving the professionalism, I don't mean independence, I don't mean they necessarily have to be independent actors, but preserving the professionalism and, and, and integrity of the OMB staff is something that I think you ought to be concerned about and try to uh, maintain. Um, management part, or management side, as we used to say, of OMB is much more difficult, I think, than the budget side. Uh, when you talk money, people listen. When you talk management, they don't. Uh, money is the, the budget side, sort of the benefits that agencies receive, the management side of the cost, because you follow up on what they're doing. And the incentive structure is such that people in agencies don't want to pay attention uh, to management. 
I'll give you just a case in point. Somebody, Mr. Turner raised the business of collecting, I think it was you, Congressman Turner raised the business of collecting loans. Agencies don't care about collecting loans. Moreover, if you use information technology uh, to uh, engage in more efficient management, um, just think of the incentives. Uh, first of all, from the budgetary side, you employ especially hardware system. You have to pay for it all up front. You don't amortize it in the federal government. You pay for it up front. The benefits flow in a long period of time after most people who are heads of agencies are gone. Their incentives are not to do that. Uh, secondly, uh, if I had to add one recommendation to my testimony, I would be, it would be to privatize as many functions as you can. But you got to bear in mind that sometimes you really get results. You know, it's the old story about be careful about what you ask for, you might get it. In my tenure at OMB, uh, we were successful in getting Congress uh, to enact legislation that allowed uh, the administration to uh, essentially farm out the collection of debts to private companies. And guess what? They collected the money. But there was such an uproar from some people uh, that uh, there was actually an estoppel on the collection of debts. So you have to, you realize that uh, some of these things are going to generate some backlash as well. Um, I don't want to suggest it's impossible to improve management. There are some good case studies. Jerry Ellig, a colleague of mine at George Mason University, just finished a study where he found FEMA was wonderfully productive, turned the agency around. Mr. Witt, is that his name, DeWitt? Right, James, James Lee Witt. James Lee Witt. Uh, his inspired leadership, uh, the use of information technology, the redirection of the, uh, the foc refocus of the agencies is a real success story. So it can be done. Let me give you several recommendations, if you don't mind. One, give managers more freedom to manage, but hold them responsible for results. Secondly, you need to recognize superior management and success cases, superior performance. Um, I ask rhetorically, when's the last time you had an agency head up here and said, Joe, you and Sarah have done a terrific job. Tell us what you did and how we can apply those lessons to other agencies. So you need to use the carrot as well as the stick. I know from being experienced in government that you're often the result of the object of criticism. It's those few little times that you get something that's praiseworthy that you remember and that spur you on. Three, I think we need to be honest about all of this reform and what we can accomplish, what we can't, and what we have accomplished and what we haven't. Uh, frankly, some of the representations made from the national, about the National Performance Review's success, um, about the Results Act, I think are terribly uh, disappointing uh, and or, and or uh, misleading. I don't think they've done well at all. You know, coining names like reinventing or re-engineering or uh, what was the REGO, I mean, those acronyms. I mean, that's not going to improve the management of government. Uh, fourth, um, get rid of the agencies and the programs that don't work. I mean, part of good management is knowing what works and what doesn't. I mean, if you're the CEO of a major firm, you're going to be constantly on the lookout for programs that work and expand those and programs that don't work, diminish those and drop them. And, uh, you know, there's just long list of agency programs. My former boss, President Ray, used to say there's nothing quite so permanent as a government agency. Fifth, and I'll be quick, you need to support OMB and grading of agencies. Not an easy job. You need to give them a lot of support. Six, finally. Uh, I, I know this is controversial, but I urge you not to try to separate the management and budget functions. I mean, the budget is the stick that makes it work. Uh, budgeteers pull on strings, management people push on strings. And um, uh, it seems to me that you need, uh, you need the, the, the power of the budget side to force the management responses. There's one suggestion I might have that you could separate them and management could really do the job. You give the person at OMB the right to fire people. I mean, even cabinet officers. You get their attention. Now, I don't think a president's going to want to do that. I mean, after all, these agency heads report to the president, not to the director of OMB or the manager. But I mean, 
save that, it's going to be very difficult without the stick of the budget or without the leverage of the budget um, in offering something they want in order to get them some, to do something they don't want to do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, we thank you. That's a very interesting bit of testimony, and you've had a vast experience on that. Mr. Inc., uh, Dwight Inc. is President Emeritus, Institute of Public Administration, former Assistant Director for Executive Management in the Office of Management and Budget, and that covers 1969-1973, the Nixon administration. Mr. Dwight, Mr. Inc., we're going to have to move along a little, so don't read it. Just summarize it. Well, <clears throat> I think I can summarize in about five minutes, if that's Great. acceptable. Great. That's terrific. The, <clears throat> my management views are based upon a fair amount of experience, both as agency and bureau heads and in the OMB. So it's an area in which I have walked the walk. Uh, I also had lead responsibility for uh, what you mentioned earlier, for persuading Congress to support the establishment of OMB, that was back in 1970, to give the President a better instrument for providing leadership in government management. That has not worked. Uh, the OMB has become more dominated by the budget process rather than less thereby limiting severely its capacity to provide this management leadership. OMB has had some very able people heading its management uh, role, such as uh, John Koskinen, Ed Nassev, but, uh, and, and they've done some very good work. But the budget nominated structure, in my view, has made it almost impossible to achieve the broad and sustained leadership role we and the Congress contemplated for OMB. Why? Well, first, the budget process has become uh, more complicated. And the, within this budget pressure cooker, there is very little opportunity, very little time left for top OMB officials to give more than just passing uh, interest and attention to more than a few. Uh, management issues. And that's one reason I've supported the chairman's concept of transferring management functions to an office of management within the executive office of the president where the leadership could devote full time uh, and energy to the task of making government work better. Second, the OMB budget process fosters tunnel vision. It makes it very difficult to address cross-cutting issues that affect a number of departments, many different uh, programs. The OMB examiners are extremely talented, but the work of each one is necessarily focused on a few related programs. And it's very difficult for them to shift attention uh, from their main role to that of dealing with management problems that cut across uh, organization lines. Third, the 12-month budget process gives undue weight to the annual budget targets and gives emphasis to the annual objectives over long-term investments that can provide long-term economies and higher quality. I found this contributed significantly, Mr. Chairman, to our difficulties in developing the long computer and information systems and other technological improvements that are needed to modernize government operations. And federal managers today have similar complaints. Fourth, the preoccupation with the budget has at times weakened the ability of agencies to improve operating effectiveness or prevent waste and abuse. I recall instances in which, both in GSA and HUD, in which this budget domination directly, although inadvertently, contributed to scandals in both agencies. Fifth, OMB is embroiled every year in fierce political battles over many budget issues, whereas the Office of Management would be free of the baggage that handi uh, most of the baggage, not all of it, that handicaps bipartisan approaches to management reform. Sixth, as has just been mentioned by the Controller General, the OMB has neither the staff nor the type of contacts that provide adequate early warnings 
of emerging agency problems that become public issues. Seventh, OMB lacks much of the specialized expertise that cannot be stockpiled in the very individual agencies. This includes program management, includes government corporations, decentralization, how to increase productivity, government-wide reform, and we could, that list could be very long. An office of management would be freed of the mythology that one must have the leverage of the budget to force agencies to improve management. We found in the executive office of management that in most cases, the more we could distance our staff from the budget process, as distinguished from distancing them from the knowledge of the budget examiners, which we didn't want to do, the more we can make that distance increase, then substitute for budget threats, the positive leadership and assistance, the greater our credibility, the greater our influence, both with the agencies and with Congress. And although I do not regard budget threats as necessary leverage, in fact, I regard generally as un unsatisfactory leverage, an office of management would need important tools in order to have the necessary impact. And in my written testimony, I've uh, listed a number of those, such as the drafting of presidential executive orders, legislative clearance, GIPRA, and there are, very, there are a number of other important uh, tools. In closing, I believe that the needs of the president and the executive branch require a management leadership capacity that is not and cannot be provided by the OMB, no matter how able the deputy director for management might be. The Congress, I believe, has a right to expect more with respect to the timely and effective implementation of legislation and presidential initiatives, and perhaps even more important, our citizens, I think, have a right to expect a management leadership capacity, which OMB does not provide, one that is not so preoccupied with the budget process that it has little time to focus on program outcomes and effectiveness of service delivery. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Rank. Appreciate that. Uh, Herb Jasper is the senior associate for McManus Associates consulting firm, and he's a former professional staff member for the Bureau of the Budget from 1956 to 1969. Now, despite my youth, I do remember those years, and you were there when the Eisenhower administration was there, and you went through Kennedy and uh, up to Johnson. So we're delighted to have you with us. You've had a vast experience there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Mr. Turner, I appreciate the opportunity to offer my uh, comments. Put the uh, mic a little closer. That's great. Um, I'm happy to comment on your interest in oversight of OMB. I understand that your principal focus is on the management functions with which uh, I've been associated for most of my career, particularly government-wide management and organization. I would suggest that you'd be hard put to find that OMB has spent much time during the past almost 20 years on government-wide organization and management. So I'm tempted to say you could have a very brief oversight hearing, but that would perhaps be unfair, uh, and I'll explain more about that. The uh, 1993 OMB reorganization was based on the presumption that you've heard frequently that you can't separate management from budget. I evaluated this curious claim in detail in my 1999 testimony before your subcommittee on the proposal to create an Office of Management. Contrary to that theoretical proposition, this, is, this administration, administration has demonstrated by its actions that one can indeed separate management from budget. I refer, of course, to the creation of the NPR, whose work has not been distinguished by its integration with the NPR budget process. NPR being what? The National Performance Review initially, and now National Partnership for Reinventing Government. But OMB insists, as you've heard, that it has elevated the role of management by integrating it with the budget functions. And a GAO report a couple of years ago found some evidence that management issues have received more attention during the budget process since then. 
But on the broader issues, I met with the GAO study team when the study was just getting underway, and I urged them to examine the totality of OMB's management responsibilities. Unfortunately, they didn't do that. You can read their report and you won't even find any recognition that there's no capacity left in OMB to deal with government-wide organization and management issues, with the possible exception of uh, GPRA and the three statutory offices of, of which you've heard, OIRA and uh, uh, financial management and uh, procurement policy. But I want to focus on what they've not done at all rather than what they've not done well, and in that category I would include GPRA. But what they haven't done at all is uh, working on government-wide reorganization. You recall I also testified here in 1995 on restructuring the executive branch. Curiously, you did not have an OMB witness, and that's because OMB doesn't know anything about executive branch organization. They have no people that work on that. They have no experts on the subject. Let me contrast that with the situation when I was in the former Bureau of the Budget. In addition to a management improvement branch with about 10 professionals, there was a government organization branch in which I was one of about nine professionals. We worked nine people full time, year round, on government wide organization and management issues. They have nobody now who does that. Uh, we worked on interagency coordination matters, sometimes accomplished through executive orders. We cleared legislation with respect to the management stuff. We wrote legislation. We wrote testimony. We wrote reorganization plans. Uh, we worked very closely with your predecessor committee and its counterpart in the Senate. And last but not least, we recommended vetoes of bills with unacceptable organization and management provisions, practically unheard of in recent years. The absence of professional expertise in the matters that I've talked about is illustrated by such developments as these. Executive orders are now handled in OMB by the general counsel, not by the management staff. Uh, it's not known that lawyers are experts in issues of federal management. When you say manage general counsel, do you, do you mean the counsel to the president? No, no. OMB with, has a general within counsel. Within OMB. And many okay. years ago, the, uh, the authority, the, the responsibility to draft and review the executive orders, which often deal with precisely the kinds of things I'm talking about, agency roles and responsibilities, interagency coordination arrangements, and so forth, those are now handled by OMB's general counsel. They used to be handled in the management organization office, where I work. Another point, political appointees have multiplied from three or four when I was there to more than a dozen now. Uh, the, the five PADs, or program associate directors, have had decentralized responsibility for things that we used to do at least in an advisory capacity on a centralized basis, either through the legislative reference process or through the Office of Management and Organization, to which the bills and testimony would be referred. Now they get referred to these so-called resource management offices, uh, where the perspective is typically programmatic and oriented toward the political image of the administration and its ability to get the bill passed, no matter what the consequences are in horrendous administrative and management provisions. Uh, the result, and I may overstate the case here again, is that your efforts to elevate the M by establishing a new post of Deputy Director for Management have been substantially in vain. And that's notwithstanding the fact that there have been excellent people in that position when it was filled. It's been said that the White House doesn't know or care anything about management. And that's probably true, not in this only in this administration, but others. It makes it all the more important that you create a non-political perspective on management issues somewhere in the president's family. We need to recreate the distinction between serving the president and serving the presidency. So long as OMB is layered with political appointees and embroiled in the partisan politics that surround budget decisions, that's not going to happen in OMB. Uh, in the uh, Reagan administration, I was in a room where about six or seven former directors of management at budget or OMB were present. They represented 40 years of experience in that position. Without exception, they had all come to the conclusion that it would never work effectively when harnessed with the budget process. Which is not to say there's not a close relationship between the two. I, I fully agree that there is. But bearing in mind Mr. Turner's questions about how to elevate attention to information technology, we need to elevate information to management across the board. And I would respectfully suggest 
that the chairman's notion of a new office of management is the best way to achieve your objectives of elevating the attention information technology, because I'll note that it can't logically be separated from financial management or for procurement policy or any of the other management issues in the agency. It has to be integrated into all of those. Uh, the chairman will also recall that uh, I appeared here on behalf of uh, the Public Administration Academy on IRS testimony, IRS legislation, and we forecast then that uh, the uh, ultimate consequences of that bill would be terrible, but they will be felt in the next administration and by the next commissioner. So this White House doesn't care very much about that, and we've already begun to see the unfortunate consequences of that so-called reform legislation. So I'll conclude by saying that uh, I think you need to institutionalize the professional expertise on management matters, and there are three things you can do in that regard. One is to create the Office of Management, which you've talked about for a couple of years now, and I have a copy of my testimony statement here from previous occasions, if you want another one for the record. Second, mandate the reduction those will be put in the record Thank at you. this point. Mandate the reduction of political appointees in OMB by 50 percent. And third, support legislation to establish a new commission on government reorganization, since OMB hasn't a clue as to how to deal with those issues. Thank you very much. Well, we thank you for that, and uh, I just want to recognize uh, Mr. Inc. I believe you've testified before Congress for 50 years. Is that not correct? Now, this is the fir 51st year. <laughs> well, you look younger than ever, so it must oh, be yes. good to testify before Congress. <laughs> I want to call on the gentleman, the ranking member, Mr. Turner, gentleman from Texas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't have any questions. I just want to thank all three of our panelists. Uh, it's always a, uh, a treat to have you before the committee. It's amazing uh, how colorful and candid testimony can be from individuals who have former uh, before their government titles. And uh, we appreciate the fact that you have uh, continued to try to help strengthen the operations of our government, improve management. And um, we always welcome your, your ideas. Uh, and I think that uh, our role as a committee is to try to highlight uh, those uh, suggestions in the best way we can, and by having you come and testify, it certainly uh, helps that. And um, I, I just would like to uh, say that um, uh, each of you have a little bit different perspective, but I, I gather that all of you uh, believe very strongly that we are much deficient in terms of the emphasis on management. And um, we'll uh, uh, continue to work on those issues. And as all of you know, the chairman's been an advocate of this suggestion of separating budget and management for at least two years. And uh, we want to continue to seek your input and your help. Thank you so much. I just have a, I just have a few uh, uh, questions before we adjourn, but I'd like in particular, Mr. Miller, looking back, did you devote uh, more hours of your day as director of OMB uh, on management or budget matters? Uh, budget, in part because that's where the political leadership, the elected officials, uh, wanted to go. I mean, I spent far more, I don't think, I don't ever think I recall receiving a telephone call from a member of Congress asking about a management issue. A lot of times I receive calls about budget issues. So it's fair to say that you spent 100% of your time on the budget. No, not 100%, but I spent more like 80-20. 80-20. And 20% were really on management? Mm -hmm. uh, I would include regulation in that. Yeah, well, uh, but nobody was looking at reorganization, better efficiency, uh, better measurement of programs, all of that. Let, let me amend the statement by saying my deputy, Joe Wright, was an expert in management issues, and we did have some division of labor, and Joe spent more of his time, I'd say greater than 50% of his time, on management issues. But uh, I, I agree with these gentlemen that uh, at least the potential for management improvement in government has not been met. Where we disagree is over how you accomplish it. I think, frankly, with all due respect, unless you have the management program or the chief manager with sufficient tools, the agencies simply aren't going to pay attention 
to him or to her. And you've got to, and you've got to have appropriate incentives, providing leadership and encouraging positive results simply is not going to work in my experience. In other words, you feel the budget cloud presumably helps reform on management. Unless... But the, but the evidence is they don't do anything. Well, you know, I was just sitting here thinking, listening to what they were having to say. You wouldn't lose much by trying. Well, that but, is to say, it hasn't worked so far yeah, very well. If right. you set up a separate office of management, I don't think it would work either, but you might learn something from doing it. So I'm not so opposed to it, except to say you've got to have the appropriate, I think, for it to work. You've got to have the, the person who leads the office with appropriate or incentives that are going to change behavior. And right now, at least, the director of OMB has the budget incentive to cause changes in behavior. And if you split it off, what have you got left? You've got to replace it with something. Let me ask these two gentlemen that had uh, the preceding uh, before Mr. Miller's term as to the number of people that were interested in and responsible for management questions within the former Bureau of the Budget and what might be now. As I remember it, in the Eisenhower administration, you had maybe two dozen people. Am I wrong on that? Oh, probably more. Uh, more? What, what I think would dramatize it is if I contrasted the two branches which I mentioned in my testimony, which aggregated about 19 professionals, with what is left now doing all of that, and the answer is one. And that's a uh, counselor to the DDM. But the point is that the, the rest of the people in the number you're remembering, it was probably more like 40, do have counterparts remaining in procurement policy and uh, uh, financial management and OIRA. Those all had precursors back in the Office of Management Organization that I was in before Dwight came. And, but again, my point is that we had about 19 people doing what one is doing now. Well, I had about 60, but we were doing all kinds of things that OMB doesn't even attempt to do now. We had to put a great deal of effort, for example, into uh, the, the outcome area, uh, and not just the input. We were very much concerned about outcomes from the standpoint and the perspective of families and communities. So I had a group of uh, my staff who spent almost half their time out in the field working with the field people. By the way, that's where most of the federal bureaucracy is, out in the field, not in Washington. And the, the OMB people have no time to get out in the field. They have no time to get out and see what's really happening, how things are really working out in the field, where the interface with the public exists. So I had a number of people focusing on that. We spent time uh, drafting presidential executive orders, which, by the way, gave us some r real leverage. Uh, the, the congressional uh, clearance process gave us leverage. W but these were uh, more in the way of positive. They weren't, they weren't threats to the agencies. So our influence grew the more we distance ourselves from the budget. By the way, departments and agencies learned long ago not to mesh the budget and management people together the way they are in OMB. One of the uh, things that I remember was the uh, development of the Marshall Plan. That was done within the old Bureau of the Budget, was it not? Yes. Yeah, yeah. and uh, TVA, government corporations, they were also the charters figured out by a management group in uh, the old Bureau of the Budget. Yeah. And yeah. recently, when uh, an issue arose about government corporations and what are they and when to use them and how to use them, there wasn't anybody in OMB that knew anything about it. So they came to alumni like Harold Seidman and, uh, and Dwight and me and others on similar issues. The, the and I think the important thing to remember is that the same group that helped Roosevelt and Truman also helped Eisenhower. Mm -hmm. There were not political intrusions exactly. on That's a right. professional staff under Eisenhower. They w he went in with more experience in management and administration than any president in the history of the country. And he looked around the White House and he said, good heavens, this place isn't even organized. And he started with cabinet secretaries, staff secretaries, decent congressional liaison, and so forth. 
but uh, he always had an interest in the management side. And we didn't know and didn't care if they were Democrats or Republicans or socialists or uh, libertarians or what. We just wanted their expertise as to uh, doing something in the management area, and that's what they called on. It was much easier for us to work with Congress on a bipartisan basis than it is now. That's in part because the, the uh, budget issues are so formidable and uh, there's so much partisanship associated with it, but it also uh, grows out of the fact that <clears throat> the, uh, when you're involved in these kinds of issues, it spills over into the management area. And because we, as when I headed the Office of Executive Management, I had some distance from the budget process. I, when I came up to the Hill, as I did frequently, I didn't carry the baggage, political baggage with me uh, that is associated with these uh, controversial partisan budget issues. Could I add just a point there? If I did the statistics on this once before, so I, I don't have them readily at hand, but if you look at the split in party control between the Congress and the White House in the 20th century, you'll find that in the first half, it was an aberration to have other than the same party in control of both ends of the avenue. In the second half of the 20th century, it's become virtually the model. So the point is that partisanship has become much more of an issue in public policy, and Dwight is exactly right. If we could divorce the management from the budget, we could perhaps get more agreement on the management issues than it'll ever be possible to get with split party control on the budget issues. We always worked with the committees on a bipartisan basis, and I would generally meet together with the chair and the ranking minority regardless of whether the chair was the same party as the, uh, the president or not. And I've worked under several different presidents, and I've worked under those different circumstances. Mr. Miller? Um, Mr. Chairman and, um, and uh, Congressman Turner, I have a su final suggestion. Uh, do you know who the first director of the Office of Management and Budget, as opposed to Bureau of the Budget was? Wasn't it Dawes? No. no. Wasn't Dawes? It was George Schultz. And George Oh, you Schultz, mean under Nixon. I was going back to 1921. No, he was the first B.O.B. Yeah. But yeah. when they changed it to yeah. Office of Management and Budget was under George Schultz. Right, right. And, and Weinberger also. And one, yes, and yeah. Cap Weinberger then was his deputy. And here is a person, actually both of them, who have had enormous experience uh, in very high levels of government, in leading corporations, um, they know management inside and out. I would urge you to ask of them what they think. We and will. And whether they feel that their vision has been achieved, and if not, why not? And what they would recommend that you do going forward. Yeah. We, uh, I was then vice chairman of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, and I went over to see them to get a cross-cutting analysis in the budget of how much we spend on civil rights activities. And I had my own 12 lawyers go into every agency, and we graded them. That's where we got our grading mania. And uh, we got some results, and they were very supportive on the management side to really make sure something happened. Any other questions, my colleague? Uh, I want to thank the staff that put this together, and I thank this panel. Uh, on my left, your right, is the staff director and chief counsel to the Subcommittee on Government Management, and Randy Kaplan is here with us. Also counsel. Did he leave? And Matt Ryan, uh, and then uh, Louise uh, De Benedetto, uh, detailee from the General Accounting Office, and Heather Bailey, professional staff member. Bonnie Heald is here, the uh, Director of Communications, professional staff member. Brian Sisk, our clerk, and Ryan McGee, staff assistant, and Michael Soon, intern. And welcome, uh, Michael. And minority staff to Mr. Turner is Trey Henderson, counsel, and Gene Gosa, minority clerk. And uh, in this last two and a half hours, we have court reporter Arthur Emerson, and we thank you for coming. So with that, we are adjourned. Well, we ran over a little. I don't want to see what they do. Uh,
Here's our afternoon lineup. The secretary of the Smithsonian Institution spoke about its future. We'll have that for you in a moment. In an hour, organizers with the latest developments of the Mobilization for Global Justice rally happening this Sunday in Washington, D.C. on the Mall. After that, President Clinton signs a Social Security Earning Limits bill. This Sunday, on Road to the White House, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time and Pacific Time, remarks by Green Party presidential candidate Ralph Nader and his vice presidential nominee, Winona